good evening and welcome once again, happy Sabbath. We welcome you to our evening's program under the theme, Standing Firm in a Fallen World. All right, we will do that, thank you. We begin this session again with prayers and testimonies coordinated by Sister Verna Francis and her wonderful team. But what is prayer? Prayer isn't a, a ritual, sorry, that depends on closing our eyes and putting on holy faces. We don't have to kneel or sit. We can pray while walking, driving, of course, with your eyes open, <laughs> or working. God responds to a two-word cry for help in the middle of a busy afternoon, just like he does to a focused prayer time after reading scripture in the morning. Prayer doesn't have to be complicated. God delights in simple words we offer to him. So let's begin our session with an opening prayer by Sister Emma Jack. Good afternoon, everyone. Let us pray. Almighty Father, the creator of the universe, you have controlled our lives from the time we were in the womb up until now. And we humbly bow before you this afternoon, asking for your mercy. In the book of Chronicles, you say that if your people who are called by your name, should humble themselves and pray and seek your face and turn from their wicked ways. Then you will hear from heaven. You will forgive their sins and you will heal their land. Father, today we pray in a special way that you will come near us. We ask that you cleanse us from all unholiness, from all that is unlike you, Father. We pray the Lord that you will cleanse us and cleanse our homes, cleanse our hearts, and cleanse our countries, dear Lord, and help us to be renewed once more. May even as we come from this press session, may our hearts be lifted up and drawn heavenwards. And may we continue to give thanks and praise even this afternoon, even as we surrender to your will and pray. May our hearts continue to be lifted heavenwards, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. A wonderful good afternoon to all. This afternoon we begin our song service with 249. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed redeemer. Sing, O earth, his wonderful love, proclaim. Oh, 
in the priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belongs. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Number four, praise my soul, the King of heaven. To his feet thy tribute bring, ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. Who like thee, his praise should sing. Praise my soul. Praise my soul, the King of heaven. To his feet thy tribute bring, ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. Who like thee his praise should sing? Praise him, praise him, alleluia. Praise the everlasting King. Praise him for his grace and favor to our fathers in distress. Praise him still the same forever. Flow to chide and swift to bless. Praise him, praise him, hallelujah. Glorious in his faithfulness. Tenderly he shields and spares us. Well or feeble frame. Rescues us from all our foes. Praise him, praise him, alleluia. Widely as his mercy flows. Angels help us to adore him. He behold him face to face. Sun and moon bow down be let us only time and space praise him, praise him, alleluia. Praise with us the God of grace. Number 528. The Lord's our rock, in him we hide, a shelter in the time of storm. Lord. The Lord's a rock, in Him we hide, a shelter in the time of storms. Be cure whatever may be tied, a shelter in the time of storm. Mighty rock, in a weary land, cooling shade on the burning sand, thankful God for the a shelter in the time of storm. A shade by day, defense by night. A shelter in the time of storm. No fears alarm, no foes affright. A shelter in the time of storm. Mighty rock in a weary land. Cooling shade on the burning. Faithful guide for the pilgrim band, a shelter in the time of storm. The raging floods may round us beat, a shelter in the time of storm. We find in God a safe retreat, a shelter in the time of storm. Mighty rock in a weary land, cooling shade on the burning sand. Faithful guide for the pilgrim band, a shelter in the time of storm. O rock divine, a refuge there, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our help, a shelter in the 
shelter in the time of storm. Mighty rock in a weary land, cooling shade on the burning sand. Faithful guide for the pilgrim band, a shelter in the time of storm. Amen. those of you who are just joining us, we just want to say welcome once again to our prayer and praise section of our special East Caribbean Conference virtual Sabbath service. We trust that you are being blessed in a very special way today, this morning and again this afternoon. I don't know about you, but I'm getting to appreciate the lockdown. You know why? Because my life has taken on new meaning. It has changed from the mad rush of routine life to one that is more pensive, reflective, and searching. I'm more conscious of following the counsels of the Apostle Peter when he urged us to add to our faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. And I want to encourage all of us to do the same today. If you find that life is business as usual for you, it's time to cry out to God for help. For I can assure you that from 2020 and onward, it's definitely not business as usual. So I urge you this afternoon to seek God earnestly. Seek him while he may be found. Call upon him while the door of mercy is still open. Be diligent to make your calling and election sure. Remember that this test is one that cannot be repeated. There is no second chance. And so in this segment of our prayer and praise program, we will be singing, sharing promises from God's word, praying and testifying. We do not have our usual two hours, but we only have a few minutes this afternoon, but we shall use every second of it to praise the name of our wonderful savior. At this time, we are going to call upon Sister Janice Applewhite to lead us in the sharing of scriptural promises. Of 2019, the Holy Spirit just brought a passage of scripture that I had known for a while to my mind. And I find that every day since that time, I am it is coming into my spirit every single day, almost every day. And I want to share this passage with you. It's taken from Psalm chapter 56 and verse 3. Psalm chapter 56 and verse 3. And it says, whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Now, I never knew that we would have cause for fear or for worry. But God knew way back then that the situation would occur just a few months ago and even now where we would be tempted to fear. But because he has given me that promise ever since the latter part of last year, I do not fear because I know that he is in control. The Lord always does what he has to do ahead of time to prepare us for what is coming. So I don't have to fear now because before COVID came, the Lord gave me this promise that what times I am afraid, I will trust in him. And I pray the same thing for you too, that whenever you are tempted to fear, you will know that you have no need to fear because God says, trust me, I am in control. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, my text for sharing this evening is one that I came in contact with some 30 years ago. And it has been such a blessing to me. Every promise in this text is real. I have proven it. It comes from Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. It says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And prove me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. 
And this text to me is even much more a reality in these times of uncertainty and hardship. We just have to put God first, trust in him, and everything else will fall into place. Thank you. Jeremiah 29, 11 states, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Brethren, the future might seem uncertain. We may sometimes feel that God isn't listening, but in spite of the many challenges and disappointments we encounter, we can still give praises to God for the wonderful things he has done in our lives. We can rest assured as confirmed in our Exodus chapter three and verse 20, that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. In times like these, we need a savior. In times like these, we need to remain faithful and obedient to God, for he has not and he will not abandon us. So let us take comfort in this text as I am taking comfort in. Thank you. Yes. Promises are always very, very precious to us. And in 2 Peter 1, for it tells us that we are given exceeding great and precious promises to help us to escape the corruption that is in the world. Now we are going to go into our prayer time, and that is going to be conducted by Sister Judith Joseph, one of our pastor's wife in the Eastern District in Dominica. Sister Judith, are you there? What about Pastor Telemark? Is he around? Yes, I'm there. All right, Judith, go right ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. I'll begin with um, Psalms chapter 61, verses 1 to 3, and it says, Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. Also, Step to Christ, um, page 93, it says, Through nature and revelation, through his providence, and by the influence of his spirit, God speaks to us. But these are not enough. We need also to pour out our hearts to him. And this afternoon, for our prayer sessions, to pour out their hearts to God on our behalf, we have Sister Donna Cook, Elder Paul Goodman, and Brother Grandison. They will pray in that order. Sister Cook will pray against domestic violence, abuse, depression in families. Elder Goodman will pray for members who have left the church to recommit their lives to Christ. And for those who are being reached virtually to accept him. And Brother Grandison will pray for our school children who are just into online schooling. So they will pray in that order. Thank you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we want to pray for those who are suffering at this point. We pray for those who might be experiencing cruelty repeatedly and often in their families. We pray for children who are being abused, 
We pray for the elderly as well. Lord, help us to remember that we too were young. I hope that someday, if you permit, we too will grow old. Help us, Lord, to be kind, loving to those who are going through serious things. We pray for domestic violence. Lord, those in families and in relationships. I pray, Lord, that you will always remember your words in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, that your grace is sufficient and your strength is made perfect in weakness. We pray for love, forgiveness, and Our Father in heaven, thank you for your love and tender mercy towards us. We thank you that you have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. We thank you that you have given us full assurance of faith that we can come to you when we are our casualties. This afternoon, Lord, we come with full assurance indeed because of your own faithfulness and commitment to us, because Jesus paid the price for us on Calvary's cross, and because of the exceeding great and precious promises that you have given to us, we come fully that you are going to do good to your church as you have done throughout the years. We come, Lord, in behalf of those who have left the for one reason or other. And we ask their father that you would inspire them to return to you, not because of the difficulties of the times, but rather that they see manifest towards them and in your word. Pray their father that they would recognize that they need to make right with you again. And we pray father that they will not be afraid to come but will come recognizing that the story of the prodigal son and many other stories in the Bible point to the fact that your arms are outstretched, welcoming us back to you. We ask, dear Lord, that they will continue to search for truth and that they will see the light in those of us ourselves to you and have given of their service and words of encouragement to them. We ask that you will inspire the church to continue its evangelistic, which seek not only to win those who have left the church, but those who are in the world groping in darkness. May your light gospel of Jesus Christ reach those who are wandering in far off places. I pray, dear Lord, that as we see our brothers and sisters return to you, we would open our arms and welcome them back, not to recall the reasons for leaving or to chastise them for not being here now, but to show the love which you showed on dying on curse for us. Bless us as we continue our efforts to reach and to win souls for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Loving Father and Eternal God, great is your name and greatly to be praised. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. Please, Lord, forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For we have sinned in thought, in word, and deed. We thank you, dear Lord, so of course, holding back, Lord, the winds of strife and for the blessings received through answered prayer. Even as our lives are altered during this coronavirus pandemic, Father, we in Barbados and in Dominica are very concerned for our children. 
who know how to adjust to online schooling, especially those who are, who are preparing for the CXCs and the national exams. We ask you, Lord, to give them wisdom, understanding, and the ability to adjust to this new way of learning. Father, we ask their Lord, because some of them have not had computers, and there are some who do not have internet access. But please, Lord, make a way for them. Make a way for your children. You fed the 5,000, dear Lord, from five barley loaves and two fishes. You provided for them, and you are no respecter of persons. So please provide for these, your children. We know that your hand is not short, that there's nothing too hard for you. We have also, you have also promised to provide for all our needs. You are not man that you should like. You are holy. And because of who you are, our eyes, dear Lord, are on you. Oh, Father, see that none of your children, dear Lord, are left behind. Hear from heaven and act, Lord. Bless your people. Glorify your holy name. And I thank you and I praise you in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Today we have another very special person to speak to us, this time on the subject of the Bible, prayer, and ministry in times of crisis. He is someone well beloved in this conference, especially because he was born in Dominica and worked as a departmental director in the East Caribbean Conference Office in Barbados. He will be remembered by his work in community services and his lay preaching training. Most of you will remember him as Pastor Stu putting the stew back into stewardship. Today, God has called him to a greater responsibilities at the division office in Miami, where he wears many hats, namely director of Sabbath school, special needs, Adventist mission, and of course, prayer ministry. Pastor Telmet, it's a delight to have you speak to us virtually today. And we know that our hearts will be tremendously blessed for the next couple of minutes as you satisfy our plea we will see Jesus. Welcome, Pastor Telemark. Thank you, Sister Francis. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a joy to be part of this um, interactive press session. I was with you last week, and um, it was really a pleasure listening and getting to know you and listening to your intercessory prayer. And um, I was really blessed by the presentation. I thank um, the East Caribbean Conference for really being a, a leader in intercessory prayer in the Caribbean Union and by extension, the Inter-American Division. <clears throat> I, I, I thank um, Sister Francis, it's Professor Francis, I should say, for her, her leadership in that area of intercessory prayer. And this afternoon, I want to speak to you on earth. Three themes, the Bible, prayer, and ministry. But I certainly want to say special appreciation to the people of Dominica, my homeland, and um, I pray that God would continue to bless that great country, a country of three hours, river, rainbow, and romance. And as a, as a blessed country with great people, very strong people with tremendous faith in God. I pray that God would bless all of the workers, pastors, and their wives and families and all of the members. And also Barbados is really my second home. I mean, some of the kindest people I've met, uh, I know they live in Barbados. Especially, I want to shout out the Black Rock Seventh Adventist Church. It's a very special church to me. And all of the churches in Barbados, but you would understand why Black Rock was a special place in my heart. So I say special thanks to the Black Rock Church. This afternoon, I want to speak to you on these, um, these topics. Let's see. Um, uh, changing of the slides. Let's get make sure we can get that done properly. Uh, okay, yeah, I think we have it now. Okay. Here is my perspective about what is happening in the, in the world today. As intercessors, we need to see the world in three dimensions. Very important. I listen to the intercessory prayer. I notice you have the perspective. God is changing both the world and the church at the same time. 
he's preparing the church to reap his harvest in the world. Our mission is to nurture and equip the church and mentor the God's people to, re to have resolute faith in him as they go forth to reap his harvest in the world. So that's the true dimension. You need to see God in the, at work in the church and in the world. God is presently fighting for the church in the world. All of the changes that are occurring in the world today, it is an opportunity that God is creating. God is increasing the receptivity of persons in the world so that the church can reap a great harvest. There's, the, the greatest time for the church is now. And that's why intercessory prayer is so critical. Intercessory prayer is designed to strengthen the church, to fortify the church, to help the church to build a relationship with God so that she can be strong in the Lord to reap the harvest that God has prepared for her in the world. So as intercessors always see Dominique Barbados, the entire world in three dimensions, God at work in the world. What is God doing in Barbados today? What changes, is, what changes are God creating? in Barbados and Dominica today? How is God changing the church in Barbados and Dominica today? And what is the church's response to the world? And, and in that three dimensions, then you would be, you, you would, you would be able to cope with the, the stress and the anxiety because you would see that God is really fighting for the church, fighting for you to give you an opportunity to reap his harvest. And so as intercessors, you need to see these three dimensions. I am, I'm really not lecturing, I'm just teaching, so you may want to take notes of these. These are important dimensions in intercessory prayer. Prayer, prayer ministry is built upon the study of the word, prayer, and ministry. If you only have intercessory prayer, people are only praying all night, they're praying, and you have um, a, a day of prayer and fasting, but there's little study of the word, then that prayer ministry would not be transformational. Prayer ministry must be preceded by the study of the word. First, we listen to God through the study of the word. And as we listen to God speak to us through the study of the word, then we are able to respond to him in prayer. There are three basic responses, prayer, testimony, and singing. These are responses to God after we have listened to God. But this is not sufficient because that dimension is to, is to strengthen the church, to strengthen you as an individual where you listen first to God and then you respond to God in prayer. That strengthens the soul, makes you strong in the Lord. But that's not sufficient. After you have experienced that relationship with God and while you are experiencing that relationship with God, it is necessary to participate in simple forms of ministry in the community, ministering to people, doing things for others uh, in terms of compassion, evangelism, witnessing, and all of those things. So is it, the ministry would strengthen your prayer life and your prayer life would strengthen your ministry. Your prayer life strengthens your study of the word. Your prayer life also strengthens ministry. So it is that triple dimension so that I want to encourage you to, to, to engage in. The Bible study, it must be preceded by Prayer must be preceded by Bible study. So I find myself reading the Bible during this crisis, just, and I just enjoy reading the word. I get up in the morning, so I read five chapters, 10 chapters, and the word of God is just coming alive to me. And that gives me tremendous mental capacity to cope with my day's activity, reading the word first thing in the morning, just enjoy reading the word. Take one, one book and read it over and over so that you, your mind would begin to concentrate. And then that gives tremendous power to my, my prayer life. And then I'm engaging in some powerful ministries which I want to tell you about. So how do you, how do you understand the world? As I said in the introduction, you must see God, the church, and the context. This is very important. Look at If you look at the context today, the, the coronavirus context, what are some of the emerging themes you, you notice during the crisis? What are some of the emerging themes in the crisis? You have emerging themes like um, distancing, quarantine, stress, financial crisis. All of these are emerging themes that, 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 that you can see right now in the crisis themes in the culture, themes in the world. Now, how, do the, how, 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 how does the church respond to these emerging themes in the world? It's important to identify those themes and then go to the Bible 
and hear what the Bible says about those themes you're seeing right now. Example, washing of hands. That's a common theme right now in the culture. What does the Bible have to say about washing of hands? What, how does the Bible interpret washing of hands and the significance of washing of hands? If you talk about the quarantine, there is a verse in the Bible that also speaks about quarantine. If you talk about stress, anxiety, all of those things, what does the Bible have to say about the theme of anxiety and uncertainty that exists in the culture today? And as you identify these emerging themes in the culture, then go to the word of God and hear what the word of God says about these specific themes. And then you can select a promise that relates directly to one of those themes and send it to someone. The, the promise synchronizes perfectly with the particular emerging theme in the culture and that the person is, becomes very receptive to the promise because the promise is relevant to the existing theme or problems or issue that exists in the world. That's a wonderful way, what you call contextualization of allowing the word of God to speak to existing themes in the culture. That's what I practice. I will explain to you a little more in ministry, but I just wanted to see that triple dimension. Identify emerging themes in your, in, your, in, your, in, your, in your country during this crisis, and then listen to, watch those themes as they echo in the Bible. What does the Bible have to say about those themes? And identify relevant verses, one or two, that speaks directly to those themes and send it to a friend and you will see a tremendous impact on the friend or friends. So here's what I wanted to, some methods I want to encourage you in intercessory prayer. These are things I am practicing. These are the ministry side of my, of my, of my ministry of prayer where I read the Bible, I pray, but then I also am engaging in, in ministry every day. And here are some of the things I, I do. One of, one, one of my ministry during the crisis I find very effective, very, very effective. I get, I get positive responses from it. It's called WhatsApp prayer, where I take my telephone and I record a prayer on a, on a WhatsApp. I record a prayer, a short prayer, just after my devotion, and I send that, that prayer to a friend. The response is immediate. The person responds and says, Pastor, I am delighted that you have been thinking about me. Just what I needed. You express my needs to God in a, in a really powerful way. I am blessed by the prayer. Thank you, Pastor. That's a WhatsApp prayer. Very effective ministry that you can do as intercessors. Not only are you just praying and reading your Bible, but you are participating and engaging in worthwhile ministry. A WhatsApp prayer is a very, very effective way of ministry during this um during this crisis. Take your phone. If you do not know how to do it, you can ask your, 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 your six months old child or your one year old child, <laughs> they would know how to do that. And you record a simple prayer and, and send it to a friend and you will see the impact. The impact, it, the, the effects of that WhatsApp prayer is very, very effective. Then another important method of prayer is called the boomerang prayer. What is the boomerang prayer? The boomerang prayer is when, when you are praying for a person or for your children or in worship, you're praying for a person. And while you are praying, you incorporate the scriptures in the prayer. You quote the scriptures in the prayer. For a typical example, a typical example of this would be, I'm praying for someone who is um, sick or frustrated or full of anxiety and I'm going to pray. I'll give you an illustration and I'm going to quote in the prayer, Isaiah 61 and verse three. That's why I didn't pray before because I'm going to incorporate prayer into the presentation. And so listen to this, Father, we come before you today and we present Sister Joan. You know what she's experiencing as a result of this crisis. She's experiencing anxiety and stress, disappointment. But today we claim your promise in Isaiah 61 and verse three, that you will take away her ashes and give her beauty, take away her mourning and grant her the oil of joy, take away her spirit of heaviness and grant her today the garments of praise that she will be called a tree of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. So in that, that's a boomerang prayer. I, I quote the scriptures in the prayer. And when God hears the scripture, coming to him, returning to him in a prayer. God responds to his promise. He responds to his word. That's called a boomerang prayer. Sometimes people may not remember the words that you speak, but once you quote the scriptures in the prayer, it becomes very, very, very effective. 
So this is when you're going to pray for people, identify important verses of scripture you may want to include in your prayer. It's called a boomerang prayer, very effective. Another method of prayer that is useful for family worship and um, Wednesday night some serve, um, service and other, other forms of worship, even your, your, your Zoom chat prayer um, ministry, it's, it's very effective. It's called a concert of prayer. A concert of prayer is where you, it is, is, a, is, is a response to God, spontaneous responses to God. And these responses include prayer, testimonies, singing, and even the quoting of the scriptures. So that you say, let us pray. And one person begins. He, he might give a short testimony for one second or one minute. Then another person spontaneously um, um, recite a, a verse of scripture. Then another person spontaneously sing the first stanza of a song. And another per person spontaneously may pray. So that's a concert of prayer where you have four different responses occurring spontaneously as the spirit of God guides the worshipers in responding to him. It's called a concert of prayer of four different responses um, to God, which takes place spontaneously. You begin probably with singing, then another person then continues with a testimony, another person continues with a verse of scripture, another person may continue with, um, with, with singing. And so that's a concept of prayer, very effective. It gives variety to your, to your ministry of prayer and it is helpful in worship where you have children and youth so that the worship is not boring. So everybody feels involved and everybody participates in that worship. The concept of prayer I find very useful. Then another important method of prayer that you, I think is very familiar with you, Professor Francis would have explained that to you. And I heard her last week explaining it to you. And then she asked you to pray and, and give a, a prayer of praise. And most of you are thanking God instead of praising God. And she, she um, very intelligently explained what it is to adore God and the difference between thanking God and praising God, which was well done. But th this method of praise called the Acts model, it is found in Nehemiah chapter one, verses six and seven. And it's a good a method of prayer for divine service. You can also use it in family worship. When you're doing your prayer sessions, you can use this model. One person gives adoration, not, another group of persons would do confession, another group gives thanksgiving, and another group give supplication. But as Professor Francis explained to you last week, it's important to make the distinction between adoration and thanksgiving. We adore God for who he is. Always keep that in mind, who he is, his attributes, his greatness, his power, his majesty, his, his, off, his awesomeness, all of these attributes. But you give God thanks for what he has done, for providing flying fish and cuckoo, breadfruit and, 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 and yam, uh, bananas and, and dashin, and uh, for bouncing baby boy. You thank God for the things that he gives to you, the things that he, 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 he does for us. We thank him for those things. And then confession, which you know, you tell God specifically acts of sins that you have committed against him. And that confession can be done in silent prayer. And supplication, which is important, supplication is where you present a particular need to God and then you ask God for divine intervention. So example, a person says that I do not have sufficient food. So you present that need of, of, of food to God and then you ask God to provide. You say, Lord, the cattle upon the thousand hills are yours and you would provide. So supplication is presenting the need and then asking for divine intervention intervention. And that's a nice time to quote a verse of scripture. When you're, when you're going to the divine intervention, you quote a verse of scripture to, 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 to match the particular request you're asking for from God. So that's a, 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 a lovely method of prayer you can incorporate in your different forms of intercessory prayer. Then this one here the, is called the three W's. Uh, it, 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 is, it is very important to pay attention to this and take note of this. This is useful for family worship. It is useful for Wednesday night services. It is useful for even your press session you're doing by Zoom. It is the word, worship, and witness. The what is the word? The word refers to the reading of the scriptures. Example, if you're going to practice the three W's, you may do something like this. So you go to Psalm 126 verses five and six, which says, he that goeth forth bearing precious seeds will doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. 
so that you can read, read these, these verses of scripture. And after you have read it, you give the, the worshipers an opportunity to reflect upon the verses, to reflect and listen. What is God saying to you in these verses? He that goeth forth bearing precious seeds will doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth. Let them reflect upon it and then let them share what God is what God revealed to them from these verses. In that way, you allow the worshipers to listen to God, allow God to speak to their hearts, speak to their conscience. It's called an encounter with God. And after God has spoken to their hearts through the reading of the, of the scriptures, then you engage in worship. Worship would involve singing. It would involve prayer. It would involve testimony. And Wednesday night, normally we begin with singing, but a very effective Wednesday night service really should begin with the reading of the word, reflection on the word of God first. And then the song service comes after, the prayer comes after, the testimony comes after, you know, because that these are responses to God. It is important. The principle here is better to listen to God first before you respond to him. It's very effective because as, as you listen to God, God is able to speak to the heart, make create changes in the heart, and then the response to God is very powerful. It is under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And so, so the word worship involves singing, prayer, testimony, and what? And then final W is um, witnessing. This is where you engage in witnessing. It may be in your service. You may give a, a card to a friend. You may give him a, a, food, ba a, a food basket. You may... Um, go and do an errand for that person. Some acts of kindness you may do to that person. It is the witnessing part of the worship. So if you have those three W's, word, worship, and witness, it really gives life to your worship. So that not only a person's um, reading the word and, and responding to God, but they are internalizing what they have experienced with God in practical ways. And in that way, the, the witnessing gives strength to the worship. The worship gives strength to the word. The word gives strength to the worship and the worship gives strength to the witnesses and interaction between these three powerful variables interacting with each other to strengthen the believer and to make him strong and powerful in the Lord. I really appreciate the consistency of intercessory prayer in Barbados and in Dominica in the East Caribbean conference. Of course, the East Caribbean conference is where the wise people live, really. The wise always come from the East and I'm so happy to be from the East Caribbean conference. So <laughs> that's my the point I'm making is the interaction between these two W's, Word, word strengthens worship. Worship strengthens witness. Witness strengthens worship and worship strengthens the word. And with these three dimensions, you are able to become a powerful intercessor. Powerful intercessor. It gives you authority. You remember this week, today we studied about the word of God and the, the, the God's authority, how God's authority influences the interpretation of scripture, how God's authority influences faith and practice, how God's authority influences everything that we do in life. The word is the authority. The, 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 the authority of the word influences the quality of our worship. The authority of the word influences how we sing, how we pray, how we, how we give testimonies. And that the quality of the worship motivates and inspires our witness. So this is a very important principles of intercessory prayer. As intercessors, you need to incorporate, not only just pray, but you need to understand the science behind intercessory prayer so that you can be an effective intercessor with tremendous spiritual authority. And so my final reflection is, yes? My final point is here is one is called reflective prayer. What is reflective prayer? This is a very important uh, a method of prayer. A reflective prayer is where you reflect to God the needs of the person for, for whom you are praying. If you're praying for a person and the person is experiencing um, grief, the person is experiencing loneliness, the person is experiencing anxiety, in the prayer, you should reflect to God the feelings of the person, this, the person's feeling of anxiety, the person's feeling of, of, of uncertainty. Express those feelings to God. So the person hear you reflecting the, his, his, his or her emotions to God, and he's saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, this is exactly how I feel. And as you reflect the person's feeling to, towards to God, then you ask God 
for divine intervention. Example, a beautiful verse I just read a while ago, Isaiah 61 and verse three. Look at how, look at how look the beauty of the word. It says, I will take away your ashes. That's the, that's the, that's the emotions, that's the feelings. And then he, he says, I, I, he asked God to give us beauty. Jesus says he will take away our ashes. That's the negative emotion, but in, he will replace it with beauty. He will take away our mourning, but he will replace it with the oil of joy. He'll take away the spirit of heaviness, which is anxiety, uncertainty, stress, frustration, and he will replace it with the garments of praise that we will be called trees of righteousness. So in your intercessory prayer, it's always good to know what is the what is the, the needs of the person, the emotions of the person, the, the, and reflect it to God. And as you reflect it to God, you ask God for divine intervention in the life of the person. So this is, yes, can I get back to my screen? Let's just, yeah. Yes, so, so this is exactly how you go about uh, uh, an effective intercessory prayer. What I try to do is just go behind the, the, what you are doing, how, what you are doing and how you are doing it. And I try to answer the question, why you do what you do. So just to get you understand a little bit of the, the science of intercessory prayer. I have 10 minutes. And so I would like to close my session with you with, with prayer. Let us pray. Father, we are so thankful for the movement of intercessory prayer taking place around the world. Your people sense the opportunity. They sense that their God is at work in the world, changing the church and changing the world at the same time. But he's changing the world to give the church an opportunity to reap the harvest that is now preparing for the church. So to this end, we pray, especially for the East Caribbean Conference, Dominica and Barbados, that Lord, you would pour the, your Holy Spirit upon these two great countries and, and, and upon your members in, in these countries, that they would sense the opportunity that is theirs, that they would spend time in the, in the diligent study of the word, allowing God to be their teacher, to be allowing, listening to God's word, rise early in the morning to read the word so they can listen to the voice of God. They can receive divine instruction. They can be fed with fresh manna from heaven. And so as their souls are being touched by the presence of God, they will respond to him in prayer and in singing and in testimony. And in this dynamic relationship of God speaking and they responding, they will become strong in the Lord to face the challenges of the day. So to this end, I commit all of these intercessors into your hands. I pray that you would visit them wherever they are, sitting in their homes, listening to this broadcast. That Lord, we pray today, that you would you take away their ashes and give them beauty, take away their mourning and grant them the oil of joy, comfort them with your word that says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Lift their minds away from the moments of weeping, of anxiety and uncertainty, and point them towards the day when joy will come, when there will be laughter once again, when we'll be able to return to do the things we always enjoy doing. So in the in between now and then, oh God, strengthen the intercessors, strengthen our pastors and leaders, strengthen the administrators of the conference, Elder Francis and Elder Thorne and the, the treasurer. Lord, I pray that they would remain strong in the Lord so they can lead God's people to a brighter tomorrow and a brighter future. So to this end, we commit all of these intercessors into your hands. We pray that you would commission 12 angels to walk with each intercessor for the rest of their lives. I pray for the children today, that wherever the children are, that the Holy Spirit will be their teacher, be their counselor. Those who are drifted from the church, Lord, I pray you'll go in search of them and bring the church in contact with them so that we can return to the fold of safety. Today, I pray for many of our members in the East Caribbean Conference who may be sick, Lord. May your anointing rest upon them. May you, may you place your hands upon them at this moment. And may your healing power flow through, through their bodies and touch every cell, touch every tissue, every muscle, and allow health and strength and vigor and restoration to spring forth 
into their bodies so that they can experience the peace of God that passes all understanding. We claim your promise in your word that says God will keep us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. And Lord, I remember my precious mother in Barbados that you'd continue to minister to her and to keep her safe. Thank you for the kindness of the people in Barbados. Thank you for the hospitality of the members of the people of the members in Barbados, the Black Rock Church. Okay, so thank you so very much, Pastor Telemac, for that beautiful session. And at this point in time, we are going to go into our testimony session. So it's an honor and a privilege that we have every day to thank God for the things that he has done. And we also have the opportunity to praise him for who he is. So I want to share with you a text that um, is an answer to a prayer, or it leads me to talk about an answer to prayer. So it's Psalms 116, verse 1, and it says, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplication. And today I want to testify and thank God for hearing my cry to learn more about him. Last year, I felt like I was not in the word as much as I, I needed to be. And there were some points or pieces of scripture that I felt that I didn't have a proper understanding of. And I think for those of you who would have been able to study the lessons last year and, and this year, we would have gone through Ezra and Nehemiah and then Daniel. And now we are into how to interpret the scriptures. And for me personally, that is an answer to prayer. So I want to thank the Lord as per Psalm 116 verse one, that he heard my cry, he heard my voice, and he answered my supplication. At this point in time, we have two other persons who are going to share their testimonies with us. Uh, the, both of them are from Barbados. And we first want to invite Sister Lorena Jacob to share her testimony. And then we're going to have Sister Carolyn Mason. OK, hi, Reverend Sao to everyone. It was the man by the name of Jean-Baptiste who said it well. Some grumble because roses have thorns, but I am thankful today that thorns have roses. It is possible for us to be fearful at this time because when we look around, we see the pain and death left in the tracks of COVID-19. We are inconvenienced, yes, because we have to re readjust to a new norm, a new way of interacting, a new way of surviving. But we as Bible believing Christians have been forewarned about these trying times. And this is just one of those times. So today I join with the others to thank God for peace of mind in the midst of COVID-19. I'm encouraged and I hope you all are encouraged as well to keep faithful because God is still in control of this world. He has us in the palm of his hand. Never think that God is unaware of what is going on. He is aware, believe it, and his will be done. So as we endure this period, I ask, this, I ask that we find roses among our thorns, more time with our family, more time for study and prayer, and most importantly, more time alone with God. He desires communion with each and every one of us individually. So hold on, this too shall pass. Be blessed and stay safe. Um, I want to thank God for rest, for time of rest. 
um, going through the, the, the years, we have been all busy every day of our lives. We've been busy on Sabbath. We've been busy from Monday to Friday. We are always busy. But at this time, I want to thank God that I'm able to rest a while. I recognize that when I came off, when we came home at first, I was extremely busy and extremely tired. And I slept nearly in about two days. And that's because we are always going and rushing on. Even at church, we go to church on Wednesday night, spend an hour, and then we are back home, hour half, hour and a half. Then on Saturdays, we are at church, we are back home, we are doing our own thing. But in this instance, God has given us time to rest a while and take stock of what he has in store for us to understand. And I have been able to visit other people's churches. Um, I've been able to go a lot of different web Zoom with other church members, other churches. So I've been able to visit. Saints in my time at my church, I've been very busy, have not been able to visit at that time as well. So God has slowed us down so that we can spend time with him and come to understand where we are at and where he wants us to be. Because we know at this time, things are very, very hectic and there's so much different things that are going on, but he slowed us down even this time of Corona to Corona 19 to be able to hear him and understand him. So I pray that we won't see it as a time of, to, that we will not be scared at this time. But we have come to understand that this time God has given us a time for reflection. And we reflect on where we are and where we are going. Because a time is going to come where we are going to be very busy in the word. And we will need to be grounded in the word. So spend time praying, spend time reading, and spend time getting to know God. Because he alone is perfect and we need to be perfect like him. So brothers and sisters in Christ, use this time to bring ourselves closer to God as everyone else would have said today and may this be not only a learning curve but as brother telly max said we can help other people at this time by prayer and whatever else we can do to bring other persons closer to him so be blessed Let us pray. Now may the God of hope fill us with joy and peace as we trust in him so that we may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we've heard various testimonies in song and word with regards to God being a shelter in the time of storm, God reaping a great harvest, answers to prayers, and most of all, peace of mind in the midst of COVID-19. We wanna thank all our contributors to this encouraging segment as we remain grounded during this world crisis. We transition now into a Bible study with a panel which is going to be moderated by Pastor Carl Dial. Their topic for discussion, end time prophecy. Let's join them. Answers to prayers and most of all, peace of mind in the midst of COVID-19. We want to thank all our contributors. Blessed Sabbath in to... segment, as we remain grounded during this world crisis. We transition now into a Bible study with a panel, which is going to be moderated by Pastor Carl Dial. Their topic for discussion, end time prophecy. Let's join them. Answers to prayers, and most of all, peace of mind in the midst of COVID-19. We want to thank all our contributors. Bless to a blessed Sabbath to everyone. I welcome you to our Bible study and discussion section that is sponsored by the East Caribbean Conference. 
I am your host and uh, moderator, Dr. Carl Dell, along with my wife, Marcia Dell. I am Ministerial Secretary of the East Caribbean Conference, and our focus for today is standing firm in a fallen world. I invite you to pause for a moment and uh, let us have a word of prayer. To everyone, I welcome you to our, our Father and our God. We just want to say thank you for being with us. We want to thank you for the opportunity to open your word and to study a portion of your word. Come by Holy Spirit to bless everything that will be said and done. You promised that where two or three are gathered, you will be there in the midst. So open to us your word this afternoon through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me introduce to you those participating in the program for this afternoon. We have Pastor Alvin Lucas, who is the Director of um, Public Campus Ministries at the East Caribbean Conference. And also we have two of our elders from the Good News Community Church. They are elders Trevor Blenman and uh, David Bayer. We also have joining us in our uh, presentation for this afternoon. We have Tonica Bino, Bino and uh, Tony Cutting. Now these are two new members. As a matter of fact, they've only joined the church about uh, 10 months ago. So they will be sitting in to our discussion as we discuss this topic of the signs of the times relating to certainly the second coming of Jesus. Many years ago, I learned a song that was so precious to me. The song is entitled, Redemption Draweth Nigh. The chorus of the song says, signs of the times are everywhere. There's a brand new feeling in the air. Keep your eyes upon the Eastern skies. Lift up your head redemption draweth nigh. It was Jesus in response to a tempting statement from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they'd asked Jesus to show them a sign, a sign from heaven. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16 and verse three, O oh, ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but can you not discern the signs of the times? And so it is on that basis that we will form our discussion for today. Sometime later, as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came privately to him saying, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16 and verse three, oh ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but can you not discern the sign of the time? No, it's, it's the computer. Sometimes later, as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came privately to him, saying, I think we have a little technical difficulty there. So let me continue. So let me continue. Okay, I would like to continue. Then uh, sometime later, as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately asking him two important questions. The first one they asked was, tell us, when shall these things be? 
and what shall be the signs of thy coming and of the end of the world. And that is what we're going to be discussing today. I will want to begin by asking um, Pastor Lucas, Elder Blenman, and Elder Bayer to give us an overview of their presentation. And, uh, so at this time, Pastor time Lucas, there, can you share, please? The, of Olive, the disciples came unto him privately asking him two important questions. The first one they asked was, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the signs of thy coming and of the Good end afternoon of to everybody. We want to be discussing I just want to begin greet by asking everybody in the name of Jesus, as we look at this very important topic, in Matthew chapter 24, 14, Jesus spoke about the end to come. In Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4, Daniel speaks about the time of the end, two different times altogether. One was the end, and the other one was the time of the end. And of course, the question is, we understand the end of time, but what about the time of the end? This time of the end is a period described in um, scripture, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Daniel 7.25 speaks to it, and it's put in two different ways. Daniel 7.25 says, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear up the sense of the Most High and think to change times and laws they shall be given unto his hand a time and times and the dividing of time. Now here we have um, the first reference to this time of the end. Then we go to Revelation and John in Revelation 13, 5 describes it as 42 months. Now, these two terms mean the same thing. They're, they're point to um, a time called the time of the end. And Jesus spoke about the end of the time, which we'll come back to. But this time of the end, when did this really begin? This was a time of extreme persecution um, of the Christians by the Roman church state power. And that's one. That period, that period, according to history and Bible prophecy, would have begun in 538 AD and ended in 1798. Why these two dates? Why these two marked off dates? One, because the Roman Empire transitioned from pagan Rome to Holy Rome, to the Holy Roman Empire in 538. So it moved from being a political state to a religious political state. And it all ended um, 1798 with the capture of the then Pope by a French general. And this was all around concluding the French Revolution. Within that period of time was extreme persecution. And it was called the time of papal ascendancy. And so the time of the end speaks to that particular period. And we'll talk more about it as we go along and its significance and what really happened in that time of the end that's important to us as we understand the end of time. Thank you. Um, my synopsis would be looking also at the Olivet Discourse and recognizing the seriousness of the time. Matthew 23, 38 shows Jesus divorcing the Jews. He says, behold, your house is left unto you desolate. When the disciples heard this, as, pastor, as the pastor just said, Pastor Dale, they asked a question, and the question they asked was, tell us when will this be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the close of the age? Jesus then goes on in Matthew 24 to give a number of troubles that will be ahead, but are not yet signs. He speaks to them about two different things at the same time simultaneously. He speaks to them about the destruction of Jerusalem and of the signs that will come at the end of the age. And one thing that Jesus that did not want the disciples to do and for us to do in these days is the date set. He said, but of that day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, 
nor the son, but the father only. So Jesus, I did in giving the signs were for us to be ready, not to be setting a day for his coming. Elder Bar, you can speak at this time. You can give us your overview, Elder Bar. Okay, I'm looking at um, Matthew 6, 24, verse 6 okay. and 7. And this is the current time we're living in. And we shall hear of wars and rumors of wars and see that you not be troubled for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nations shall rise up against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms, and there shall be famine and pestilence and earthquake in diverse places. Now, right now, we are in the COVID pandemic, and people are wondering, is this the end? Is this the, the Lord going to come immediately? Is this the end? But, but Jesus has warned us that pestilence, pestilences will come, and I consider the COVID virus one of these pestilences that Jesus warned us about that will come. So we should not be afraid. We should look up because our redemption draws nigh. Okay, thank you so very much. Uh, let's continue then with Pastor Lucas. Pastor Lucas, you made reference to some um, pointed signs to indicate that um, the, the, we are living in the last days of Earth's history. Can you expand a little further? I, I, would know you want to mention to us things like an increase in knowledge and, and um, yes. lawlessness and things like that. Please expand a little more on these signs for us at this time. Yes, I mentioned two things I mentioned in my introductory statement about the end and the time of the end. These signs are occurring in the time of the end. And um, so this is where we are at now. And there are a number of signs that Jesus spoke about that will precede his coming or will precede the time which he described as the end, the end of the world. Um, for example, um, Daniel speaks to us about in chapter 12 and verse 4 about the increase of knowledge. That's one. Um, John in Revelation 16, 13, and 14 speaks to us about demonic activity. Um, Second Timothy Paul writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 7 speaks about lawlessness. Um, he also speaks about departure from the faith, the rise of false teachings, false Christ in Matthew 24, Jesus himself, increase in traffic and modern transport, of course. Um, Nahum 2, 4, poverty and economic instability, James 5, 3 and 4, and of course, fear. Fear, and I would like to maybe say a little bit about fear. We are living in a fearful time. The Bible did say that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. And the fear is now dominating the minds and hearts of most people around the world. Um, this time of COVID-19, people are afraid of death. And COVID-19 is spelling death. Hence, um, the rules, the regulations, and the washings and the things that are not new because the Bible um, testified to health, to health that should exist among its people way back then. It's interesting that we're back to it now. But fear is now controlling persons rather than faith. So fear is one of the big signs of these times. And it's, I think it's the devil's, one of the devil's um, big weapons too, to get persons afraid. All right, Elder, Elder Blenman, you yes, made sir. reference to some historical events that suggest that there are signs, that there were signs that we are in the, the, the last days of Earth's history. Can you share a little further on these? And um, we also have Tony and Tonica who, um, in the event that there is need for clarification, they are free to ask questions um, to any of our, our, our panel so that they can have an understanding of 
the times, the signs of the times. Yes, the in, in Matthew 24, verse 29, in this Olivet Discourse, Jesus is quoted as saying, in immediately after the tribulation of these days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. History shows that in 1780, it was a dark day when the sun refused to give its light. And then history also shows that in 1833, we had the falling stars from heaven. So these two signs that Jesus would have spoken about have indeed come to pass. All right. So these are signs in the, in the heavens oh, yeah. as we well, yeah. said. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, there are some other signs, I think, in the book of Luke. Uh, Luke talks about... Uh, Luke 21 verses 25 to 28 talks about the distress of nations with with our perplexities. We have all around um, ethnic wars and tribal conflicts. We have uh, devastating fires and floods and hurricanes. We have um, wars that have ravished Middle Eastern countries like Somalia and some, um, you know Syria and the, the the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, so, and now in these last days, we have the COVID-19 COVID um, pandemic. Um, are we then at the, the time of trouble? As, as um, this is a question I have for Elder Bayer. Would you say that these suggest that we are in the time of trouble? I would say no. Because in the time of trouble, we will not be able to spread the gospel. And we are still able to evangelize at this time. Um, when the time of trouble come, all um, evangelism will have will ceased already. And uh, whatever condition you are, you would have re remained. Because God will then pour out his, pour out, as I said, the angel pour the vial on the persons and the persons who would be able to go through it will be alive and they will already be sealed by God so they will not be affected and the others who are wicked will be cut down or will, be, will be affected by the plague so the fact that we are still able to evangelize means that we are not in the time of trouble but if we are so fearful now in the coronavirus you can imagine what will happen when that time of trouble comes Pastor Dale, yeah, um, on, on the question of war, I'd just like to share two stats with you. The first one sh shares that over $100 million are spent an hour by nations in preparing for war. And another fact, factor states quite clearly that man has never made a weapon that he has not used. And we recognize that nations are stockpiled with nuclear weapons. So these are two sobering thoughts we must look at. They're spending this enormous amount of money, $100 million dollars an hour be praying for war and that man has never yet made a weapon that he has not used oh, interesting facts indeed um I have a where? question yes go ahead, go ahead um, my, my question to, is mainly to um pastor alvin lucas um what does 1798 relates to now in this time what is the correlation all right, 1798, that was around the time of the French Revolution. Um, the French Revolution essentially was about the church against the people, basically. And um, the, the papal government, the Roman church, um, was that period is used to, to, to describe the end of the papal government because the Pope at the time was captured by General Berthier. Um, this was on the instructions of Napoleon. Now, that ended the time of persecution, right? Now, I said earlier um, that of, of the, the rise of the papacy and papal persecution. And that, that period kicks into motion the time of the end in which these signs that we're now talking about exist. Um, just what our brother Ben was speaking about just now. So we are living in the time of the end, the time before Jesus comes. And these signs, like the signs in the sun and the moon that we heard about, and men start filling them for fear, for looking after those things that are coming on the earth. Um, you know, there's, pol there's political problems too, not just um, the coronavirus situation. Uh, there are political problems. So the significance 
of the 1798 to all of this is that it kicks into motion. It tells us when this time of the end um, would have begun. And uh, now Jesus explains to us and Paul and, and also um, John and Daniel what is going to be happening during that time, which will precede Christ's return. You know, it was Jesus himself who said, and I'm reading for you from the book of Luke, Luke chapter 21, reading verses 25 and 26. The word of God says, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexities. The sun, sorry, the sea and the waves roaring, men's heart failing them for fear and looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now, what is significant is that the next verse is in verse 27, and then shall they see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So since we have the, the, the sun and the signs in the sun and in the moon and also in the, in the, um, in the stars, then the next great event really ought to be the coming of the son of man, the coming of Jesus with power and great glory. So we're living as it were between um, Luke 16, Luke, Luke 21 verses 27 and also um, verse 28. Now here's another question I have that someone shared. Is the coronavirus one of the seven last plagues? I'll that, that question. <laughs> That's okay. Hello, Bayer. I will say no. It, it is a pestilence. And we've, we've had worse pestilences in the past, and there were not the seven last plagues. So I would say that God has given us a chance to look to Him. Because if we were on our everyday jobs, we would have not, not time for Jesus, but now we have friends who are praying, we have people who we can share something about God with, we would have never had that opportunity before. So it has given us a chance to evangelize. So it is not one of the last plagues, but it is an opportunity for us to draw others closer to God. I must say though that when we see these signs, we should not be getting ready, we should be ready. Do not look at the signs to get ready. You should be ready because at any time, Jesus can come. All right, Elder Blendman, you made some references to um, some other signs other than what Pastor Lucas mentioned. You want to emphasize those at this time? Yes, I would like to emphasize that when Jesus spoke to the disciples on the, the Mount of Olivet, he was speaking about two things that were going to happen simultaneously. And one of those that he spoke about was the destruction of Jerusalem. And history does show that this happened. In AD 70, Jerusalem was sacked. But Jesus had said there in, the, um, in Matthew 24, and I read for you verse 15. So when you see the desolating sacrilege spoken of with the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that this desolation has come there. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountain. Let him who's on the house stop not go down to take what is in the house. And let him who is in the field not turn back to take his mantle. Here Jesus was showing, but Jesus was saying that Jerusalem destruction was coming. Did it take place? The answer is yes. So if Jesus predicted that was going to happen and it happened to Jerusalem, that was a sign that when Jesus spoke about what is going to happen at the end of time or before the time of the end, that these signs were also going to take place and they would indicate that the time of Jesus' return was imminent. Again, let me emphasize that signs are not given for us to calculate the time when Jesus is coming, but for us to keep our focus on the kingdom and to live lives that characterize God. I have another question for, um, this one is for David Bayer. Um, you said earlier that um, this coronavirus is not one of the last plagues, seven plagues, um, cause we are still able to evangelize. Can can this be also um, the text that says relating to the text that says that the gospel that the Son of Man would not come until the gospel is preached in all the world? 
yeah, can this yeah. be one of the ways that the gospel spreads to all of the world? Yes. Um, God will not come until the gospel has been preached in all the world as a witness. Because no one can say they did not know, they did not hear, nobody told them. I think the coronavirus has given us an opportunity for it to go faster the technology because people who would have never listened to us before or taken a word from us before are now listening. So this opportunity is that the word can go even faster and then Christ can come. All right. This is to Tonico, you had a question for us? My question was, so, so are you saying that this, that there are more things to come? COVID-19 isn't the only thing that's going to affect us, that maybe later on there's more things that's going to come before Christ actually comes for us? Yeah, there will be more things. He said this is the beginning of sorrows. He didn't say it was the end of sorrows. He said, when you see these things, it's the beginning of sorrows. So there will be more things that to come. But if we as Christians prepare ourselves to look up for these things, we will not be afraid that the world will be. Because we know they must take place before Jesus comes. Okay. Okay. Uh, Pastor Lucas, you want to expand or, or, or Elder Blenman? Yes. Um, I would like to say here, Pastor, that when Jesus was asked to give a sign of his coming, he gave the manner of his coming as one of his signs. In fact, if you read verse 30 of Matthew 24, it says, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Mm -hmm. All tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Jesus Christ, when he comes the second time, will be coming on clouds. Three times in the Bible, we see Jesus with these clouds. When he was going back to heaven, a set of clouds took him. In Daniel, when he was moving from the holy place to the most holy place, he was accompanied by angels. And when he's coming the second time, angels will come with him. Now, Jesus gave this as a sign because he warned us that there will be many false Christ, saying, people saying he's in the wilderness, he's in the desert. So Jesus said, when you hear that, do not go. My manner is going to be such that every eye will see me as the lightning flashes from the east to the west, so shall the son of the man be. So when people ask anybody that teaches you that Jesus is not coming again on the close of heaven, it's a false teacher. That's my point. So his, the manner of his coming is a sign of his coming. All right, Pastor Lucas. Right, just to add to that, Brother Ben Lemon's contribution, we sing the song, Look for the Way Marks as we journey on. Look for the rear marks passing one by one down through the ages past the kingdoms for. Yeah. Essentially, the song is saying that um, these signs are just evidences along the road as we journey towards the kingdom. The goal is the kingdom. And we should not become sign focused to the extent that we do not see the kingdom. Um, there is a tendency for people to become so sign focused that they become fearful. Um, and um, that fearfulness will lead, lead, matter of fact, it leads to lostness. So there are a number of signs in Matthew chapter 24. Um, there are a whole set of signs that Jesus spoke about. Some of them existed around the time of the fall of Jerusalem. Um, we just mentioned a few. He mentioned false prophets shall arise and deceive many, yes. Um, and because iniquity shall abound the love, many shall wax cold. Um, we're living in a time where it seems as though, in a lot of cases, what used to be wrong is now right. Uh, what used to be right is now wrong. Um, and uh, that is one of the evidences that as we journey towards the kingdom that we, must, that we will see. And there are primarily evidences that the Lord is coming. So one has to keep one's eyes focused on the coming of the Lord. But it's like um, you're walking a road and um, you know, you 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 will pass buildings, you're gonna pass side streets, you're gonna pass different things. One must not become attracted by the, the buildings, regardless of how beautiful they are, or how ugly they are, or the side streets, regardless of whatever they look like. One cannot become attracted or distracted by those things. They're just evidences telling us, well, you are on the right road. 
So we need to be aware of that. And Matthew 24 speaks to a whole set of them. I don't know if we have the time to go through all of them in, in terms of our present, um, the present age that we're living in. Um, but Jesus did say in 13 that he that shall endure unto the end. So as we journey along, the challenge is that we've got to endure to the end. Because he who endures to the end, um, the same shall be saved. And whilst we're enduring, he also said that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. So as we journey, there are tasks to be accomplished. There are proclamation of the good news, right? Um, endurance, which means we are now in COVID-19 era. Um, we got to endure this because as sure as it started, it will end. Nobody knows when, but he that endures to the end. Um, and when I say endurance, I'm talking essentially in terms of your faith in God and not to be overcome by the fear that's taken over so many people. Okay. Now we will try to conclude our discussion in, in five minutes time. Um, just want to emphasize the fact that the exact time of Jesus's second coming has not been revealed. These signs do point, however, to the fact that Jesus will come. He Amen. promised that he, he will come. In, in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, and verse 36, he says, Of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels in heaven, but um, my Father. And hence, because of that fact that nobody knows, Jesus also said something to us. He says in Matthew 24, and verse 42, Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. These signs... Of the times do tell us again that Jesus is coming soon. He's coming with his his glory, his father's glory, the glory of, of the angels. And the word of God tells us that when he comes, Revelation 1 and verse 7 says, He cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. I heard the president mention this morning in his message that the Lord Himself will is going to descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel. I want to say thank you so very much for sharing with us this afternoon. We trust that you have benefited from the discourse or our discussion as we stand firm in a fallen, in a, um, in a fallen world. Let's consider the times because Jesus soon will come. And when he comes, there'll be no more Corona, no more Ebola, no more pneumonia, no more cholera, we will be with Jesus forever and ever. Let's pray for our health coordinators and God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Dio and the panelists. Thank you for addressing the history and prophecy of end time events. We now move smoothly into our airway segment. Our airway program this evening, standing firm in a fallen world, being agents of hope in a fallen world. Now we've seen examples in the Bible of young people like Joseph, uh, Gideon, Samuel, Daniel, David, and our Jewish servant girl who was Naaman's handmaid. Let's now hear from our youth right here in Barbados and Dominica as we as they become agents of hope to this fallen world welcome to We're in a talk. Hi, 
Hi, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this, our AOI iConnect session. And we are so happy that you can join us here for another session. Now, we hope that you were blessed by the proceedings of Sabbath and that you had a wonderful lunch and you are back here with us to be indeed blessed by another session. Now, today, our focus will be on being agents of hope in a fallen world. Now we want to welcome all those who are joining us from Dominica. Hi persons from Dominica, hello. Now if I say this wrong, you can blame Pastor Denny. He gave me a crash course. So bonjour, yes. And to our Bajans, hi my Bajans, hi. And to those joining us from other countries and countries around the world, we wanna say welcome and thank you for tuning in to us, to our AYI Connect session. Right. So through, although we are isolated or quarantined in our homes, we can give God thanks for allowing us and giving us this opportunity where we can come together virtually and still be connected with one another and still be connected with him and through his word to speak spread the gospel throughout the world. And we therefore wanna give God thanks and praise for this opportunity. Yes, indeed. Now we wanna thank you again for all those tuning in. And we also want to say that although in this world we can see that there is fear, we want to stand firm and be agents of hope in this fallen world. Now we pray that today's program will give you that motivation and encourage you that you will possess the drive to be an agent of hope. Now before we actually go in, into further our program, we will bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Their kind and most loving Father, we want to thank you for continuing to bless us. Thank you for your protection. Thank you for allowing us to be safe in this COVID-19. I ask that you will continue to draw a hedge around us and that as we continue to minister to your people, your people will be indeed blessed by our ministry, Lord. We want to thank you for everything that you have done for us and everything that you will do for us. This is my prayer in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Now we will do our AYS aim, motto, and pledge. So let's begin our aim. The Advent message to all the world in my generation. The AY motto, the love of Christ compels me. Now the pledge. Pledge, loving the Lord Jesus, I promise to take an active part in the youth ministry of the church, doing all I can to help others and to finish the work of the gospel in all the world. Now there is a way song, but I can't sing. So I'm gonna leave it to those who can sing. And on that note, get it on that note? On that note, we want to welcome the Jack family from Dominica as we go into our song service. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Do join us, Barbados and Dominica, even as we share and sing this afternoon to the names, honor, and glory of God. We are going to use our Advent Youth Sing to do the first number. We are going to sing number 10, Brighten the Corner Where You Are. Let's join together lustily as we sing. Do not wait until some deed of greatness you may do. Do not wait to shed your light afar. To the many duties ever near you now be true. Brighten the corner where you are. Brighten the corner. Shine for Jesus where you are. Brighten the corner where you are. Someone far from harbor, you may guide across the bar. Brighten the corner where you are. Just above the clouded skies that you may help to clear. 
Let not narrow self your way deeper. Go into one heart alone, may fall your song of cheer. Brighten the corner where you are. Brighten the corner, shine for Jesus where you are. Brighten the corner where you are. Someone far from harbor, you may guide across the bar. Brighten the corner where you are. Here for all your talent, you may surely find a need. Here reflect the bright and morning star. Even from your humble hand, the bread of life may feed. Brighten the corner where you are. Brighten the corner, shine for Jesus where you are. Brighten the corner where you are. Someone far from harbor, you may guide across the bar. Brighten the corner where you are. You'll we'll now do song number 11. Can the world see Jesus in you? Do we live so close to the Lord today? Passing to and fro on life's busy way That the world in us can a likeness see To the man of Calvary Can the world see Jesus in me? Can the world see Jesus in you? Does your love to him ring true And your life and service too? Can the world see Jesus in you? Do we love with love to his own akin? All his creatures lost in the mire of sin. Will we reach a hand whatsoever it costs to reclaim a sinner lost? Can the world see Jesus in me? Can the world see Jesus in you? Does your love to him ring true and your life and service too? Can the world see Jesus in me? As an open book, they all eyes weary to our words and acts giving daily heed. Will they be attracted or turn away from the Christ we love today? Can the world see Jesus in me? Can the world see Jesus in you? Does your love to him ring true and your life and service too? Can the world see Jesus in me? Song number 60, help me find my place. Song number 60, help me find my place. Okay, this is our last and final song. Let's sing together number 60. Two, three. There's, There's a place for every worker in the vineyard of the Lord, where with all our pores united, we can toil with one accord. There are needy hearts now waiting for the help which we can give. Let us guide them safely onward. Let us show them how to live. There's a place for oh, may I find where my mission, where my mission I, I can feel. Be it humble or exalted, may I hold it with a will. Help me serve my generation with a heart of love and grace. Help me, Lord, from this time on, find and occupy my place. There's a place for every teacher in the Bible training school. Where all natures are made sweeter 
as we teach the golden rule. There's a call for loyal service where we all may work and pray. Let us then be up and doing, teaching men the Savior's way. There's a place, oh, so may I, I find it, where my mission, my mission I, I can fail. Be it humble or exalted, may I hold it with the will. Help me serve my generation, with a heart of love and grace. Help me, Lord, from me. There's a place for every Christian in the church which we should serve, where we may uphold the standards and from duty never swerve. There are burdens to be lifted, there are hearts in pain and grief. Let us have the heavy laden, bring them comfort and relief. There's a place, There's a place. so may I find it, where my nation I can fail. Be it humble or exalted, where I hold it with the will. Help me serve my gentleman. Help me, Lord, from this time onward, find and occupy my place. Thank you, Dominica. Thank you, Barbados, for your lovely singing. God bless you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your mercy and your grace, for being a wonderful and awesome God to us. At this moment, we ask for your forgiveness, dear Father, so that if there's anything that has come between us and you, any sin, dear Lord, that you would kindly wipe it away from our record so that we can be found holy and just before you only through the merits of your son, Jesus Christ. We want to pray, dear Father, for the conference First of all, at this time, for its pastors, its leaders, its administrators, dear Lord, for the workers, that you will continue to keep them as they continue, dear Father, to be able to lead your people and your church in this time of a worldwide crisis, dear Lord, and in this region of East Caribbean Conference, that your Holy Spirit will grant them the wisdom that is needed to do all that we can to ensure that your gospel continues to be spread to your name's honor and glory. We want to pray, dear Father, for the protection of everyone with the whole advent of this COVID-19, dear Father, especially those in the hearing of my voice. We pray for our families, dear Lord, that you will continue to help us to trust in you even when we cannot trace you, and that you would help us, dear Father, to be able to know that whatever we do and whatever we say, even while we're in quarantine, that we should always have an attitude of prayer and still try to our best to represent you even while we're in private because it always matters dear father that wherever we are that we always lift our hearts and our minds heavenward and most of all i want to pray for our youth as well dear father that you will help them to have a, a fervent desire dear lord to thirst after righteousness so that while they're on their laptops their cell phones their tablets dear lord that whatever they seek to view whatever they choose to watch whatever they choose to listen to, that it will be pleasing and honorable to your name. 
I pray that you will help them to continue to spend more time in your word. And as we have more time, dear Father, in these quarantine and curfew lockdowns, dear Father, I pray that you will help us to be able to find more time and a love and a desire to search deeper into your word so that we can build a relationship with you that would only come about and a result of blessings. And I pray, dear Father, that you will help us as your people to be able to draw closer to you in these times so that when all is said and done and time shall be no more, that many of our youth would have drawn others closer to you so that they too can be saved at last in your eternal kingdom. Thank you for your mercies. Thank you for your love. And thank you for hearing and answering our prayer in no other name but the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and for his sake. And may everyone say, Amen. We indeed want to thank the Jack family for that lovely singing and for our Pastor Drew Murray for leading us into that prayer session. We know that prayer is very, very important and vital for us as Christians. We can grow together spiritually and we can grow together closely together as we fellowship and we pray to God, especially in this time. At this time, we're going to welcome Sister Aikima Denny as she leads us into an interesting nature nugget, after which we will have a special item of music by brother and sister Ken and Navanta Griffith. Hi everyone and happy Sabbath. Welcome to another Nature Nugget. For today's lesson, we are going to look at a small creature. It's colorful and can fly backwards. Can you guess which animal it is? It's the hummingbird. Let's see what this hummingbird is up to today. A female Anna's hummingbird plays the roles of surveyor, architect, and builder. She begins her nest with a platform of soft, fluffy fibers plucked from nearby plants. She's chosen a small tree branch that offers a bit of scaffolding to anchor her construction. Working in a circle, she uses her own small frame to shape the cup. Now she needs a special thread to tie it all together. It's made by another skillful architect. And fortunately, she can find it almost anywhere. Spider silk. The nest grows around her. She works the inside of the bowl with her feet, compressing the resilient fibers into a thick wall. With her needlework and footwork almost done, she begins to shingle the outside wall with lichen, seeds, and moss. And suddenly, it's perfect. A fit little home for the tiny hummingbirds to come. From the video, we saw that the hummingbird takes extra care in building its nest. 
It knows the best cotton bits and the best spider thread to make a soft and secure home for its chicks. Do you know that Jesus cares about the birds and he cares about you? In this world, beautiful buildings and even the animal homes will one day perish. But Jesus made us a promise in John 14 verses 1 to 3. He tells us, do not be troubled and that he has gone to prepare a place for us, a safe place from COVID-19 and all the other diseases and disasters that hurt us and our loved ones. He has a home safe for each one of us in heaven. And like the hummingbird, which will shield her babies, Jesus will certainly shield his children. Let's all prepare for that great moving day into a home in heaven with Jesus.
That was some indeed lovely singing by Sister Navanta Griffith and some wonderful key playing by Brother Ken. We want to thank them so much for bringing that special item of music. Now, sometimes I wonder, you know, why Lord did they not give me a wonderful singing voice? But nonetheless, we can praise God in so many different ways. And we also want to thank Sister Aikima for that lovely and interesting nature nugget. I would have received a message saying, well, look, the uh, bird stole the spider web from the spider. But again, we are all here to help each other. At, at the end of the day, the spider, as someone else said, the spider can make it. So once he can make it and he has the opportunity and the, and the means of sharing and giving to someone else in need, then we can all learn from that spider and also the hummingbird. So we want to thank those two, well, those three persons for those special items. Now, at this time, we're going to invite Pastor Jamil Blackman to give us our devotion on Job entitled The Resume, after which we will hear from Pastor Reed and his family. Good evening, everyone. And thanks for joining in for our devotional this evening. The devotional is titled, The Resume. Are you looking for a job? Well, maybe not right now. Probably you did in the past, or maybe for the future when this pandemic is over. A lady by the name of Erin Greenewald suggests 43 resume tips that will help you get hired. Listen carefully, take notes if you want. She says, when telling your story, don't put everything on there, but keep a master list of all jobs. Put the best stuff before the fold. Ditch the objective statement. Keep it reverse chronological. Keep it on one page. Consider an online supplement. When formatting, she says, keep it simple. Carefully stand out. Make your contact information prominent. Design for skimmability. Get help even from a professional. She says, when highlighting work experience, keep it recent and keep it relevant. No relevant experience? No worries. Have no more than five or six bullet points per section. Bring it down a level. Give them the numbers. Take it one step further. Show, don't tell your soft skills. Don't neglect non-traditional work. Mix up your word use. Use keywords. Avoid empty words. She says, when outlining your, wait a minute, are you following? Maybe you didn't get all of that. You can probably check it online. I just want to hone in on one simple thing that she said here. Erin says, this will only help you. In other words, there's more to it. It will only take you part of the way. But what if I told you? that I knew of a resume that would guarantee you the job. It's way simpler than the, the tips that Erin gave. And the boss would always boast about you. As a matter of fact, you would be on the top of the boss's list when it's time for recommendation. More or less, even the face of the company. What if I told you that I know someone who used this resume and they got the job? And instead of a decrease in salary, when it came to retirement, it was twice as much. What if I told you there's a vacancy for this job right now, even though the world is on shutdown, even though persons are being laid off, even though our country is experiencing a national crisis, this job is still available. What if I can guarantee you that at retirement, you will be far better off than when you began. I'm talking about a resume that guarantees you the job. The Bible says in Job chapter 1, verse 1, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. Let's look at his resume. He was perfect upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. Perfect here does not suggest absolute sinlessness. It signifies rather completeness 
integrity, sincerity, but even in a relative sense. The man who is perfect in the sight of God is the man who has reached the degree of development that heaven expects of him at any given time. Job met the expectations of heaven. He was blameless. Job was upright. In other words, morally sound. He was straight, level, just, correct, and right. Job feared God. This biblical expression denotes loyalty and devotion to God. This has nothing to do with being afraid of God. Job eschewed evil. Literally, he turned aside. The idea is that of avoiding evil, turning away from it as from the presence of danger. In other words, Job avoided evil like Corona. The four ideas included in this verse are not mere repetitions to impress upon the reader that Job was a good man. Rather, they complement one another in forming a total picture of an outstanding character. His character was so outstanding. His resume was so splendid that the boss was not afraid to recommend Job. Hear this. In Job chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, after Satan invites himself to the heavenly meeting, God asks him, where are you now coming from? He discloses from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. In other words, Satan was looking for work, looking for someone to tempt, looking for someone to make suffer, looking for someone to bring crisis in their life. Ultimately, he was looking for someone to curse God. His intent in roaming the earth is to destroy our resumes and destroy us in the process. However, God was about to show Satan that his business will fail and that there are still some people on earth who will maintain excellent resumes. It's one thing when persons speak about your resume, but it's another thing when God talks about your resume. Hear what God says in Job chapter 1, verse 8. Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? A perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. So you may be asking now, what's the big idea about having an outstanding resume? Is it just for God to boast? Let me take you back to Genesis chapter 18, verse 26 through 23. God and Abraham, they're having a conversation. And God is willing to save the city of Sodom if Abraham can find 50 righteous people. Abraham bargained and pleaded with God right down to 10 and still couldn't find anyone. One researcher suggests that there were approximately 3 million people in the city of Sodom. And you're telling me Abraham could not find one one good resume? I want to suggest today that we are not yet consumed because God can still find good resumes here on earth. Our country is not yet consumed because God can still find good resumes here in Barbados and I even say in Dominica. We shall weather the storm. We shall rise from the ashes. Because Psalm 91 verse 9 to 11 says, Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Things may appear to be rough now. And by the looks of what's happening around us and the reports given, it's promised to get worse before it gets better. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest 
in our body. That's taken from 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through to 10. Job rested his hope and assurance on the reality summed up by six words. For I know my Redeemer liveth. If God is dead, our preaching is a waste of time. If God is dead, then our labor is in vain. If God is dead, then we are all of all men most miserable. But because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds a future and life is worth the living just because he lives. In other words, Job was saying, with whatever state of life I experience, I will remain contented for I know my Redeemer liveth. Not only that, but he shall stand at the latter day. The conclusion of the book of Job says, so the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. After all of that, the Lord still blessed Job to live another 140 years, allowing him to see his son's sons even four generations thereafter. Tell me, if your resume could guarantee you such an end, wouldn't you take the job? The boss has issued a bulletin. For those interested in the position, it says, to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my father in his throne. Revelation 3.21. It also says, he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Revelation 21, verse 7. But before you get all excited, before you start jumping around about all that you're going to get and your inheritance and you're all happy, there's just one question that I, I have to ask. This may probably put everything into perspective. That question is, what does your resume look like right now? Welcome to Iconic. for the Hey, good everyone. You're just here to give you a few tips uh, what you can do as a family during quarantine. So we hope that these will be helpful to you and your family as you spend this time together. Okay, um, one of the good day everyone, hi. One of the things that I found to be helpful, helpful is having a routine and I'm not talking about something that is rigid or anything like that, but just like a daily routine to ensure that you have things in order. So as a family, we usually start off with worship and our worship sessions are not usually long, but we always uh, um, include the girls in all of our worship sessions, whether it's praying or um, they do song service or do the reading. We always include them because um, worship should be child friendly and it also gives them a chance not to only listen but to actively participate and it helps build their spiritual life so worship together is a must keep it short but very effective and always include the children okay yes that's good that's the worship part so she continue to the next part eating together. <laughs> um, you know, during the week when we are at our normal jobs and our normal routine, it is very, very difficult to have a meal together. And we found that during this time, this has been what, almost three weeks or so, <laughs> three weeks or almost four weeks, um, we have been home. And Mercy. <laughs> we have used 
almost every opportunity to eat together. It may seem insignificant, but it is very, very significant. Everybody likes to eat. We all love food. But when you can share food with your family members, it changes the whole dynamics. Um, it opens your children up to more conversations. They would tell you things they don't normally tell you. Um, and it's just good to spend time so, just and anyway, join and join your meal together. Yes, so eating yes. together mm -hmm. is a is very good, good thing right. to next one. Time to do mm -hmm. um, daily chores. Right. In in the daily chores, um, I have kitchen duties. I have I have <laughs> I have taught my daughters um basic Wait, hold, things hold on a minute. you have kitchen duties i always have kitchen duties so, if i don't eat uh, if i don't cook you all will die what <laughs> you all will die is that true yes you all will die so baby no 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 <laughs> have i not cooked at all yes you did so what did you no twice. you, you missed you misleading anything twice what okay I mainly have kitchen duties. I'm in the kitchen most of the times. Um, I have brought the girls into the kitchen and I have taught them basic things. Well, I would have been doing this before, but they know how to prepare basic breakfast um, items. Um, they know how to turn the stove on and off, just basic things in the kitchen. And I know mothers, we like to get our stuff done and get so out of the kitchen. The children to turn on and turn off the stove? Yes, they know how to turn on and off the stove. The stove has the child um, thing. They know how to do it, of course. Whenever mm. they are using the stove, they would be doing it under supervision. Oh, right, that's right. Anyhow, um, yes, so basic things you teach them in the kitchen. Uh, mothers, this is a good time. So please be very patient and you would see the benefits of it. Oh, well, I, I really would love if everybody would join me just like how we join the table and eat and whatever. I would love everybody to join me when I go to the and take care of the dogs. I would love as a family for us to come into the yard and clean up the dog dung and you know clean down feed the dogs and when necessary once a month give them a nice bath i would love if we can do that as a family yes the children will come out in the yard with me and they would watch and ask questions and they would want to, you know, put out the chow and stuff. So it would help let them, they let them do that this, this morning. Yes, this morning I have to feed the dogs, even though it's sour. But yes, I would love everybody, everybody to come out, you know, and to, to share in this wonderful, wonderful chore of cleaning and feeding our lovely dogs. And moving on, um, because we are coming down, I have... Time is up. Yeah, go ahead to the last one. You um, you sab of time, you a few things just now. We have things like exercise. You could include them in your exercise um, routine. True. You can also have um, downtime in terms of reading time. And when they see you reading, it also encourages them to read. Sleeping time too. Let them sleep too. Movie time. Yeah, let them um, sleep. No, good. Yeah, they have, have time during the day that they can sleep. Good, clean, um, of course, family movies and games. We play a lot of games, a lot, a lot of games in terms of Connect Four, Snakes and Ladder. Well, we have Scrabble. And for Sabbath, um, of course, we have worship, but we have found um, we when we play team games, so we did Boy, Girl, Animal, Plays Things, Biblical, um, thing and charades that is something that we included to bible charades and it is amazing to see how much your children would know in terms of biblical things so those are some of the things that we have done and we wanted to share with yes. you and we hope and pray that as you go through this time that you would really look at it as a time to spend with your families don't look at it as a chore don't look at it as something that um 
is tiring or so, sure. it will make a difference yes, in your children's lives and sure. in your general so, family yes. life. Thank you so much for your time. Time is up. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Bye-bye. We want to thank the Reed family for that very interesting and fun tips that they have given us. And I hope everyone remember them to do chores together. Definitely get that exercise in, worship together, and of course, eating together. So we would definitely want to thank the Reed family for that lovely family activity. And we also want to thank Pastor Blackman for that wonderful and interesting devotion on Job's resume and how we can also update our resume essentially. Now just remember that Job, we are studying Job for our Bible connection and we want to encourage you to study the word of God, study Job. Job is yes a long book but it's a very interesting book. You can get so much from this book of Job. So we just want to encourage you. At this time, we are going to go into two sessions. One will be for our children, AJ White, which will be delivered by Sister Nicole Goodrich. And also one for our AYs, which will be delivered by Pastor Sean Shepherd. Do enjoy. Evening. Now, how are you this evening? We are fine, thank you. And how are you? I'm fine also, thank you. Now, this evening, we'll be making some lemonade. What will we be making? Lemonade. Lemonade. Do you like lemonade? Oh, I do not know. <laughs> okay, this evening, we're going to be following some instructions. I know. You sure? I sure. Joshua, do you know what are instructions? You know what are instructions, Joshua? Hmm. Do you know any instructions? Ah, I have one. What? To obey your mother and father, you will live long in the land. That's true. That's true. That is one of God's instructions. How many instructions does God give us? Ten. I was a ten. Very good, very good. Well, now we're going to make this lemonade and I need you to follow the instructions. You have sugar, you have your lime, and you have your water. Okay, what you have? Sugar, sugar your lime, lime, and water. water. So we're going to add our sugar. Add the sugar, Josh. You want to add the sugar? Okay, let me add it in here. Put it in here. Sugar. Very good. And I'm going to squeeze the line. And I'm going to leave the juice for a strong, I'm going to leave the skin for a stronger flavor. And you'll say you want to add the water for me? Yes, please. Add the water. Oh, add I'm this sure. one. Add the water. Okay. I'm going to put a little spare in here so that the sugar crystals will dissolve. Can I have a chance? Be orange. Be orange? Yeah. This is the lemonade. Oh, oh, two orange. Two. Oh, okay. Oh, two. Yeah, oh, two. Okay. I want me to turn. Can get it turned to? Hello, Jerry. Put the meat down here. Meat, meat, meat here. Meat down here. Meat here. Oh, so that you can You just here? I don't know. No, instructions are very important. Okay? Very important. That's the fish. I mean, meat down here. Okay, we're going to add a little more water. Can I get a stir? Yes, you can stir. That's just a nice So, are you going to taste it and how it's going to be? For the good instructions, you taste Josh?
are you? you? Okay, boys and girls, did you see how important it was to follow instructions on making that lemonade? No, wasn't it important even for Noah to follow the exact instructions to build the ark? What if he missed a step? Or what if he did it according to his own decision? No, just like the making of the lemonade without the sugar, it was awful. But with the sugar, when it was added, following all the steps, it was yummy. God had a plan for Noah's life because he was faithful and because he obeyed God. And because of his obedience, Noah and his family were saved. Obedience leads you to make a difference in your world as Noah did through preaching. Well, only his family were saved. We can still do what we can to share the gospel. So does God has a plan for you? Yes, he has a plan for each and every one of you. His plan for us in the Bible reminds us that he knows the plans that he has for us. Plans that will prosper us and not harm us. Plans that will give us hope and a future if we but obey God's word. His plan for our life will be successful too. So little boys and girls, follow each step, follow every instruction, and read your Bible every day to continue to be just as faithful as Noah was. Good afternoon to everybody and God's blessings to you. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And today I hope that it was a happy day for you. And uh, I hope that God's blessings will be with you as we spend some time in God's word. I will be speaking on the topic, what makes someone an effective witness of hope? What makes someone an effective witness of hope? especially in this time, this present time that we're living in. Today, I want to introduce to you the KEEP principle. I said the KEEP principle. 
this principle comprises of four components, knowledge, experience, example, and purpose. When added together, we acquire the key principle, K for knowledge, E for experience, E for example, and P for purpose, K-E-E-P, key. It must be made clear today that becoming an effective witness takes more than just an external expression of the evidence of a change, but it details the internal experience, which is the building block or foundation of a true witness. To be an effective witness, it must be one that is focused both internally and externally under the guidance and leadership of God through his Holy Spirit. Would you bow your head? Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. We ask, Lord, as we experience today, to the, this, this message, we ask uh, that your Holy Spirit will be with us. Allow us, Lord, to know of you, to understand and experience you, to become an example of who you need us to be, and also to live out the purpose that you have for us. So bless us now, even now, in Jesus' name. Amen. I need to set some, some footing or a foundation. I need to define some key terms in the topic of focus, namely the word or words, witness, effective, and hope. Witness, effective, and hope. Hope is a feeling of of expectation and desire for a particular thing to happen. Effective means successful in producing a desire or intended result. Witness. Witness means open profession of one's religious faith, faith, true word or action. And I'm looking at a witness on a religious or a Christian point of view. With uh, that foundation laid, I can move forward. Don't you think so? Firstly, we will look at knowledge. To become an effective witness, one must know what they are a witness of. And for this focus, we are looking at being a witness of hope. Being a what? A witness of hope. So the first step in being an effective witness is uh, knowing, is having a knowledge of hope. The songwriter Edward Moth uh, penned these words, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust uh, the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. First Peter chapter 1. Verse 3 uh, said this, uh, Bless be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy have begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, from the dead. Our hope lies in Jesus. Our hope lies uh, with uh, the man uh, who is uh, our Savior. Savior, who is our kinsman redeemer, who is our friend in a time of trouble, our high priest, and he is our Lord and King. Psalms 39 verse 7 says, and now Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. Only in Jesus can one build hope. And by knowing who Jesus is, having a knowledge of Jesus will bring you to the place of hope, knowing what hope is and who hope is. And then we can move ex um, speedily to experience. You not only need to know 
hope, but you need to experience hope. And for you to experience hope, you must exhibit faith, exercise faith and trust. The Bible says in Hebrew chapter 11, verse 1, now faith is the substance of a substance of things hope for the evidence of things not seen so 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 experience call for a little patience experience call for a little time and the bible says in isaiah 40 verse 31 but they that wait upon the lord hallelujah they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint because with experience comes a level whereby you could be patient. But if you wait on God, you will build an experience that will make you strong and better. Romans chapter eight, verse 24 to 25 says, for we are saved by hope. What are we saved by? By hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what man seeth, why doeth he yet hope for? Uh, but if we hope for that, for that, for that we see not, then do we with patient wait for it. Experience takes time. So it means uh, that you need to build experience by spending time with the one who is hope. And after you know who is hope and what is hope, you gain experience by being patient and spending time. And after you have done that, you need to be an experience sample of hope. You have to live what you have experienced and, and now experience will be transformed into example. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 12 says this, let, not, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. God calls us to be an example once we have, a, once we have experienced him, we are called to be an example because that same chapter of Timothy, uh, verse 16 says, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them for in doing this thou shalt be thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee oh so so you have to live what you preach don't tell someone to trust when you can't don't tell someone to have faith when you're faithless don't tell someone to love when you can't love others. Don't tell someone to be strong in the time of trouble. And when time of trouble come, you're running and hiding. Don't tell someone to, to give when you are all about yourself. Don't tell someone that you need to be like Jesus when you are not doing so. And so we need to understand that uh, we, we must know, have a knowledge of, of hope. We must experience hope. And then after we experience hope, we will become an example. We must become an example of hope. We are talking about being an effective witness of hope here. And after you have done the first tree, you must understand that all these three leads to the purpose of your calling you are not called to be your own you are not called to tell people oh i know about hope oh i have experience or oh, hope oh i i i have i am an example of hope but hope have a purpose even for you and i today i want to let you know in second corinthians chapter 4 verse 16 and 18 says for which cause we faint not but uh, through our outward, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. You know why? Because of hope. For our light affliction, Paul says, which is but for a moment, 
work it for us a fair and most exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I want to let you know that our hope is not temporal. Our hope is not just for a little time, but our hope is for now and eternity. Our hope is a hope that will last for eternity because for us to become an effective witness, we must understand that within hope there is power. Isaiah 40, one verse 10 says, fear thou not, oh dear brethren, this is the encouragement, for we have a purpose. Fear not even in this time, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with thy right hand of my righteousness. I want to let you know today, uh, that God wants you to be his example in this world of sin. God wants you to be uh, the living example of what hope can be. And for you to become an effective witness, you must have knowledge of hope. You must experience hope. You must be an example of hope. And then the hope of God's purpose in your life will be expressed fully. Uh, let me close right now. Uh, let God keep you in his hope. My dear friends, my brothers and sisters, as you find time to have a knowledge of him, as you spend time to experience him, as you, as you become the example for others, uh, for others, and finally live out his plan and purpose for your life, as you become an effective witness of hope in this world today. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, help us to have that knowledge, the knowledge of your hope in your son, Jesus Christ, the living hope. Help us to be and to live, uh, to have an experience with you, that as we experience you, Lord, that we will grow strong in our faith and in our faith in hope. Help us, Lord, uh, to live as an example uh, of, of that hope that we have known and experienced. Help us, Lord, that others will see us and know that there is a God and there is a God of hope, even in this time. Help us also that we will live out your purpose. And even if we live uh, out your purpose, Lord, uh, let all the glory, the honor and the praise be unto your name because you are God and you are God alone. So God bless you. And until we can see again in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. We want to thank you, Pastor Sean Shepherd, for that discussion, for reminding us about that great hope. And thank you, Sister Nicole Greenwich, as well for that lovely discussion as well and reminding us to be obedient in order to follow God's will. And in order for us to be obedient and follow God's will, we must read the Bible, we must connect to him. Yes, and we must also be examples of hope and we can be examples of hope through obedience and through following God's instruction. So thank you guys so very much. At this time, we're going to go into another special item of music from Alika Mills. And after her special item, we're going to see a panel discussion by uh, brother by sister Lizra Fabian and she's also going to be with her Pathfinders and Pathfinders will be ages 10 to 15. So after the special music then we're going to have our panel discussion. Hello everyone, I pray that this song will be a blessing to you. <laughs> There's a list 
everything that I've done wrong. I'm so ashamed. There's nothing left for me to hide. This is the day. I must answer for my life. My fate is in the judge's hands. But then he turns to me and says, I know you. Welcome to our special segment on creating agents of hope. We are really delighted that you are here with us today. And I am Agent of Hope, Liz Fabian, and I'm collaborating with four amazing other agents of hope. Agents of hope, please share your agent name as we begin this program. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Agent of Hope, Twinkle Joseph, reporting for duty. Welcome, Twinkle. Hi, I'm Agent Alana Javis, reporting for duty. 
Welcome, Alana. It's a delight to have you here. Thank you. Yes, next agent. My name is Jaden Scotland, an agent of Hope. Thank you, Jaden, for joining us today. Welcome. My name, my name is my name is Oran Dodds, and I'm 16 years old, and I'm an agent of Hope. Wow, I feel so blessed to be surrounded by four amazing agents of Hope: Twinkle, Agent Twinkle, Agent Alana, Agent Aiden, and Agent. We also have a, an activity for our children ages um, three to 10 at this time. And we'd want you to be involved in, in doing this activity while we speak about the rest of the, the program. So we asked, I just shared my screen and we're asking all the children ages three to 10 to draw, paint or create your superhero. And we ask you to ask an adult next to you to be able to post this superhero to Facebook and or Instagram or Twitter with the hashtag SuperHopeECC. The hashtag again, SuperHopeECC. So we're going to leave this there. A little for you to see is draw or paint, draw or paint your superhero and we want you to post it to Facebook or Instagram with the hashtag SuperHopeECC so that everyone who looks at this hashtag can see what the superhero is like. Thank you so much. Now, we move on to the rest of our program. We ask you to speak to someone next to you and share with them what you think the, hope, the word hope means to you. When you think of hope, share one word that comes to your mind. And while you do that, we'll go right back to our agents as our agents share with us a little bit more about hope. Agent Twinkle, what does the word hope means to you? Or what does it mean to you? The word hope means to me something that I expect highly or something I will favor. Thank you, Agent Twinkle. That's very good. Agent Alana, what does the word hope mean to you? The word hope means that, well, I am expecting or looking forward to something that has not yet happened. Okay, great. That's that's really interesting. Um, we move on to the male agents. Agents Jaden Scotland, can you share with us what the, the word hope means to you? Agent Jaden Scotland? Can you share with us what the word hope means to you? Hope means to me to have confidence in something good that will happen. Ah, that's very interesting. I hope everyone else is listening and, and taking in what hope really means to our young people. And finally, we have Agent Oren Dodds. Oren, please share with us. Okay. Hope is such a small word, right? But it means a lot to me. Hope is a state of my mind that believes, you know, or it desires positive outcomes of anything or any situation I may have in my life, you know? So basically, hope is like the difference between holding on and giving up. You know, it's a tiny smile I put on in a devastating situation I may have in my life. You know, so hope basically encourages me to have positive thoughts on any situation I may have in my life, you know? So though it may be good or bad, but anything or any situation in my life, I have hope and I know that sooner or later, a positive result will come out. So that is the definition of hope to me.
Okay, great. Thank you so much, Oren, for sharing that. And right now, I would like to know who is your favorite superhero and how does this person bring you hope? We start first with Agent Twinkle. Well, really, I am no favorite superhero, but I enjoy watching the superhero movies with my brother. But the mere fact that they go around saving people and saving the day brings a lot of hope to me. Great. That's really awesome. We move to Agent Jarvis. Agent Alana. My favorite superhero is Wonder Woman. She brings me okay. hope because she assures me, well, she assures the people that she will save the day no matter what. That's awesome. Agent Jaden Scotland, who is your superhero and how does that superhero bring you hope? My favorite superhero is Captain America because whether he wins or loses, he does it together with his teammates. Okay, thank you. And finally, Agent Oren Dodds. Okay, well, as the other students said, they have superheroes. But to me, I don't really have a superhero, you know, like Spider-Man and Iron Man and all the others. I have a physical or a real hero. Though he may not be super, but he's a hero. And his name is Cristiano Ronaldo. And some of you all may be wondering, who is this individual? And he is one of the best footballers, I should say, in the world right now. And you may also be asking, how does he bring hope to me? Or how does he give me hope? Well, at a very young age, Cristiano Ronaldo didn't have the best of life, you know? He, was, he had a health problem at the age of 15. He was diagnosed with a heart problem. And, you know, his parents felt that, you know, his life was going to end. His parents felt that, you know, that's it for the son. But he, he had hope. He believed that sooner or later he'll be healed. And he, he had a passion for football, just like I have a passion for, for, for football. So he decided that one day, he, is going to become the best in football. And despite his health, despite his situation with monies or whatever it may be, but he decided that one day he's going to become a good individual in society. So basically his, his situation or his story motivates me to become a better boy. And he was just 15 when he was diagnosed with the heart problem. I am just 16. So whatever situation I may encounter throughout my years, I know that when I grow up, I can make the best out of the situation that I have. So he is my motivator, he is my role model, and I is his, his life motivator awesome. to become a better person. Okay, great. Thank you, agents, for sharing about your favorite superhero and, and how that person brings you hope. Now, there are a lot of people who are discouraged, who are depressed, and they feel that this is the end of the world. They have no hope. Can you share with us how you as a young person can practically bring hope to others in this dying world? Let's start with Agent Twinkle. I can bring hope by being different. Being, bringing hope is like being kind, honest, respectful, and helpful when others are not. For example, as the head girl of my school, I go around helping others when they need help. And I sometimes stand up for others when they don't have enough confidence. Great. Thank you for sharing that, Agent. That's really impressive. Let's move on to Agent Jarvis. Alana Jarvis? I, I can encourage them that Jesus loves them and one day he will bring us up into heaven with him. Okay, great. That's really encouraging. Um, how about you, Agent Scotland? Jaden Scotland? How do you practically bring hope to others in the dying world? Agent Jaden Scotland? Miss, um, I can stay strong because if someone sees that one person is strong, they'll have faith that God is coming back and there is hope for all of us.
Awesome. Let's move to Agent Oran Dodds. Presently, I'm the head boy of the Afro Waldron SD Academy. And I use this opportunity, well, despite even though I wasn't the head boy, I use this opportunity to help others, you know, so it's like my friends can testify to that. I'll be walking around at school and I may see one of my friends probably sitting, sitting down here looking sad. You know, I'm, I'll come to talk to them. They will tell me I didn't have breakfast, I didn't have snack. And without even hesitating, I will, you know, give them a $5. For example, if we stay back for classes and they may not have money to pay boss, I would give them a five dollars, you know. It is in my heart to do good for others. Also, I am a very good motivational speaker. So uh, as That's I really good. I'll be seeing my friends sitting here and I will just come randomly, start to talk to them, you know, and encourage them to hold on despite whatever situation they may be going through. So in this way, I am sharing hope with them and I am encouraging them to hold on and whatever situation they they may be in there's a positive side to it so this is how i that, help others. that's that's really good that's really good well there are many persons who are looking at this program here today and maybe wondering how can they also be agents of hope um i know you four are fantastic agents of hope but can you share with the others who are looking how can they too become agents of hope agent twinkle Well, as agents of hope, we can try to persuade our friends to be loving when others are not, caring when others are not, and also to be firm when others compromise. Okay, great. And Agent Alana? Agent Alana? You can encourage them to read the Bible so that they can know Jesus for themselves, so they can be encouraged to have hope or to, to tell others and encourage them to have hope. That's really, really encouraging. How about you, Jaden? How about your agent, Jaden? How can you share with others so that they can also be agents of hope. Um, they can either, they can have hope in the dark times, and they they should believe that Jesus is coming back. So, when if Jesus is coming back, then there is more hope in people because Jesus said He will never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. And how about you, finally, Agent Oran Dutz? Okay. So for my entire life, my mother has always encouraged me to be a leader and not a follower. And that has been my mantra for my life, right? So as I was saying, in school, whatever my friends, well, most of my friends, those who are close to me, whatever they see me doing, then eventually they will think, okay, it's right, so they should do it. And this is what I love, right? So it's like, I would be, for example, in school with my friends sitting together, and they'll probably see me do a certain activity and you know they would want to join me and do it as well so when they are seeing me motivating my other friends or my other schoolmates and when they are seeing me sharing with them when they are seeing me you know trying to encourage them and motivate them to do better then in return they will try to do the same they'll want to do the same mm -hmm. because they feel okay or at least doing a good thing so why not why should why why can't i do it as well so in this okay. way i'm encouraging them to help others have hope. That's really good. You guys shared some really amazing tips and encouragement to everyone. First, you let them know what hope means to you, um, who inspires you for hope, how you practically help others and bring hope in a dying world, and how you could also encourage them to be agents of hope. Twinkle, could you share for us just a courage of just a chorus of this encouraging chorus, the song, the chorus of this encouraging song? Twinkle, just a chorus of the song. Stand firm when life changes, stand firm through the ups and downs. Stand firm for you know that God is in control. 
Stand firm when life changes. Stand firm through the ups and downs. Stand firm for you know that God is in control. The storms of life will push and pull, but we are standing on the rock that never rolls. The storms of life will push and pull. We will keep standing. God is in control. Stand firm when life changes. Stand firm to the ups and downs. Stand firm for you know that God is in control. Stand firm when life changes. Stand firm to the ups and downs. Stand firm for you know that God is in control. We want to encourage you. Thank you so much, Twinkle, for sharing this, this room the encouraging song stand firm for God is in control and in Job chapter 17 and verse 15 it asks Job asks where then is my hope who can see any hope for me we encourage you to be that one to share hope with others when they cannot see hope anywhere there's this challenge that we want to give to all our youth across the Eastern Caribbean conference we want you to take a selfie or be photographed looking hopeful we want you to then share this selfie or photograph on Facebook and or Twitter and or Instagram with the hashtag ShareHopeECC. We want you to write a hopeful courage with this photograph and tag at least five friends. I've already shared my first one for this afternoon and we want this to go like wildfire across the East Caribbean conference. So this is your challenge of how you can practically be part of the Share Hope ECC challenge. I wanna thank all my agents for being here this afternoon. It was really awesome having you. Agent Twinkle Joseph, Agent Alana Jarvis, Agent um, Jaden Scotland and Agent Oren Dodds. Continue being this amazing, awesome, some agents of hope. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Welcome to I Connect. It's for the My fellow believers, I pray to the name of Jesus Christ, our soon coming King. My name is Gregory Einfeld, I'm from Guyana, and I'm a preaching evangelist. In these times of our crisis, many of us are fearful. Fearful because these crises have invaded our homes, our schools, our churches, our countries. But I want us to be reminded what Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 27. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be fires and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. But see that you be not afraid, for all of these things must come to pass. What Jesus is saying is that God is still on the throne and he is still in control. God says to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 12, 9 11, I know the thoughts I have towards you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. What God is saying today is that I want to give you an expected end. So around the way that is set before you, you see COVID 19 may have invaded our lands, but God is saying around the way that is set before you, trials and tribulations may come our way, but God is saying, like the Apostle Paul, you need to press towards the mark for the price of the uncalling. Throughout the new week, God is saying to us, I am not giving you the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and a sound mind. As you go through the new week, we're reminded to have faith and have confidence in Jesus Christ. I want you to ask yourself this question. What can I do to show that I have faith and confidence in Jesus Christ throughout this crisis? Good evening, everybody. It is so good to be with you this Sabbath evening. I just want to take the time to thank our host, Serena Boyce, for doing an excellent job in taking you through this evening's program. Um, as you would have just heard the short devotional from Brother Eiffel, I just want to point, us to, uh, point our attention to a feature we have started for the past two Sabbaths, or at least from last Sabbath. Um, it's entitled, Is This the End? 
It is where we look at questions that pertain to end time events, especially as we are faced with the COVID-19 virus. One of our young persons asked this question, could this um, pandemic um, be the beginning of the little time of trouble? I did some studies and I found that the little time of trouble mentioned here, and I'm hoping that's what the person um, intends to answer or get an answer to, is referred to in early writings, a book by Sister Ellen G. White, um, and that particular period of time is mentioned in page 85. It speaks about a little time of trouble that occurs just before the seven last plagues are poured out. It seems as if, um, she, or she says, that at that time, the latter rain or the refreshing for the presence of the Lord will come and will give the people of God power to declare his word in truth and energy. And it so happens that at that time as well, trouble will come upon the earth and the nations will be angry, yet not angry enough to break the, the, the hold that the angels holding the four winds would have on the earth. In other words, this time of trouble is not yet the end, but leads to the end. Now, I looked further and found that the time of trouble could also be referred to as Jacob's trouble. Um, we know the story of Jacob, where he was fearful and anxious to meet his brother and sent gifts ahead of him, um, divided his property in hopes that he would appease his brother's anger. And eventually he left um, a, 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 an attitude of, of appeasing into an attitude of prayer, asking God for help. And as the story goes, he met with an angel and wrestled with him until daybreak. And when he realized that this was no ordinary man, he held on to that angel who was Jesus, and he prevailed by holding on to Christ. In like manner, the people of God will succeed and make it through this trying time because of their holding on to Jesus. In fact, we are told in Revelation 7, 14, that those who are clothed in white robes, those who will make it, um, that great multitude in heaven that John saw, will be those who have come from the great tribulation and would have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. So the question is again, could COVID-19 be the beginning of this time of trouble? Well, we can't exactly say yes or no. Um, the fact is, we don't know when Jesus will come. We don't know when probation will close. And we don't know what single event could spark that little time of trouble or the great time of trouble. What we do have assurance of is this, we ought to make the most of the time that we have now, since every biblical sign of the end time points us closer to Christ's second coming. It is my wish that we would make ourselves ready for that great time. Second Peter three verses 11 and 12 say that seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner, what kind of person should we be yet in all holiness and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of the Lord, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. God calls us today to take our walk with him seriously. He wants us to be agents of hope, not only for ourselves, but to minister to others the everlasting gospel. And you don't have to wait for the time of trouble to come. You can be an agent of hope today. Shifting from this question, I must also let you know that we, as the Youth Ministries Department, even as far as the Inter-American Division, want to help you, all of you who are listening and beyond, to become equipped agents of hope. And so what we have in place is a Youth Leader Certification Program. It's going to be run from April 19th to 30th for all our pastors within our union and division. Um, they have received the information and they would have begun the application process. But for our local church youth leaders, your training begins from or spans from May 1st to 31st. And the steps are seen here. You may have seen this slide before, but you just enter information on iadayonline.com, create a new account, and note that there's a registration code that has been asked for. Your code is English, the word English. You will input that and right away you will be entered into the portal 
that you can get yourself certified as a youth leader. Please note that the sessions will be ongoing every day and you will log in and sign up at your own convenience. Secondly, I must also add that the Christ Salvation Online Campery is on for Sunday tomorrow at 10 a.m. The link is, as you see on my slide, feel free to take a screenshot and be prepared for the Cry Salvation Online Campery tomorrow from 10 a.m. Finally, be on the lookout next week because as a conference, we'll be looking at a theme um, dealing with the F virus. What is the F virus? I urge you to come next week and find out. Also, if you wish to share with us a video, a, a song, a spoken word, a poem, some way of giving thanks and praise to God, you are free to do so. You can send a three minute video to your AWA leader who will send it to myself or any one of the national AY committee members in Barbados that we can have you online. I must also apologize that because of time, we are unable to run Kahoot this evening as many of you have been hoping for. However, we have a Kahoot quiz that you can do at home in your spare time. This should help you better prepare for next week when it'll be on with Kahoot. We know many of you enjoy our Kahoot games and we want you to be prepared. So screenshot this link, you can type it in and you will find a quiz on Job chapters four through six. I challenge you, try it at home, try it at your local church, um, get involved, get active in the study of God's word and be prepared to be a better agent of hope. With that, I wish you God's blessings and I will now hand you over to our treasurer, who will our East Caribbean Conference treasurer, who will give us our Vesper thought. Good evening to everyone. Our Vesper thought to take us through the upcoming week is entitled Spiritual Lessons from the Coronavirus. Lesson number one is one which should be the mantra of all Christians. Trust in the Lord. According to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, pestilence is defined as a contagious or infectious epidemic disease that is virulent and devastating. The death toll around the world is spiraling out of control as health officials are trying to come to grips with the situation and find a potential vaccine that will improve the health of those who are affected. Understandably, it is a time of uncertainty and many persons are fearful. Fearful that they or their family may become infected, fearful of job losses, and fearful of food shortages. It is at this time that we must place our trust firmly in God. According to the servant of the Lord, Ellen G. White, in the book, The Great Controversy, page 590, in accidents and calamities by sea and land, in great conflagrations, in tempests, floods and earthquakes, and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. He imparts to the earth a deadly taint and thousands perish by pestilence. But the assurance is given in the book Last Day Events, page 72.1, that if we are in Christ, we have nothing to fear for the future, except we forget the way that the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. So let us have faith in God rather than fear of the situation. Lesson number two. God will provide for you and me. Matthew 24, 12 says, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Locally and internationally, fear has caused persons to hoard food supplies and other essential items, which traditionally would have been sufficient for all the citizens in each country. The Christian's response to pestilence or plague begins with some of Jesus' most famous teachings. 
Do unto others as you would have them do unto you and love your neighbor as yourself. Put plainly, the Christian ethic considers that our own life must be regarded as less important than that of our neighbor. Let us consider the extraordinary story found in 1 Kings 17, 7 to 16, where a Phoenician woman is living in the midst of drought and famine. The widow and Elijah have nothing in common in nationality, culture, or religion. Yet she places her trust in God to the extent that she provides food for Elijah before her own family with death knocking at their door. Indeed, Psalm 37 verse 25 says, I was young and now I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread. Lesson number three, the importance of physical contact and human touch. Physical contact and human touch distinguishes us from animals. From a warm handshake or a sympathetic hug, we have developed languages, cultures, and emotional expression through touch. In a tech-saturated world, human touch is in danger of becoming rare, if not obsolete. And with the onset of the coronavirus, this will be further exacerbated. What will be the effect on humanity by the time this virus has passed? During his earthly ministry, Jesus touched the lives of many, lepers, the blind, the lame, and the woman with the issue of blood. While we are not promoting physical touch at this time, we must promote and participate in emotional and intellectual touching through the spoken word and through prayer. We want to encourage you in like manner to touch the lives of persons today. Lesson number four, isolation and community spread. For the purposes of this presentation, we will utilize the terms isolation and community spread in a different context from the way they are defined in light of the coronavirus. At this time, our country is on the lockdown. Many of us may have more time on our hands, which we would not have if we were still at work or school. Let us take this time to reevaluate our priorities and connect or reconnect with God. Jesus isolated himself at times to go into the wilderness to prepare for the challenges ahead and intercede on the behalf of others. Let us community spread messages of hope of the good news of salvation to all those in our neighborhood. Lastly, it's a matter of perspective. Jean-Baptiste Alphonse Carr, a French novelist and journalist quoted, some people are always grumbling because roses have thorns. I am thankful that thorns have roses. In other words, how we view things dictates our response to the current situation. Even though we are separated physically as members of the body of Christ, we still have the ability to connect virtually and worship together even with other brothers and sisters who are living in countries where borders are closed. Additionally, the Caribbean Union Adventure Campery, organized by our very own Pastor Anthony Hall, was initially scheduled to be held in Barbados at our Oldbury campsite over the Easter weekend was postponed due to the pandemic. Now, this special event is going to be facilitated virtually on Sunday, April the 19th, 2020. Who could have ever envisioned having a camp with so many young tots online? Creativity has no boundaries. This crisis has birthed a new way to reach others and share the gospel. To God be the glory. 
may it be a spiritual chrysalis, which at the end, like the emergence of a butterfly from its cocoon, produce what the Bible describes as a new creature with a stronger faith that can testify of the goodness of its creator. In closing, we leave you with a text of comfort for the upcoming week, taken from Zephaniah 2 verse 3. Seek the Lord and you will find refuge. We want to thank Brother and Sister Dotton for that lovely Vesper thought. Just a bit of clarification for our previous announcement. Um, persons in Dominica are also free to send their videos to their AY leaders, who can then forward to myself through the email youthministries at eastcaribe.org. Um, we are catering for the entire conference, and we want all of you to participate as best as possible whenever called. This time we want to thank everyone who would have participated in today's AY service. We want to thank our pastors, AY leaders, adventure and pathfinder leaders in both territories who would have ensured that AY and club activities continue weekly at your local church. I also want to thank our youth from Barbados and Dominica, especially officers of ANYA in both islands who assist in planning, coordinating and executing youth ministries programs within our conference. Special shout out to the National AY Committee of Barbados for leading out in our Friday Night I Connect initiatives and our Sabbath AY I Connect programs. They're doing an excellent job and we must commend them for this. I want to also thank my secretary, Leandra Greenwich, for always keeping me in check and ensuring that things, uh, information gets out that you all can be blessed. Again, thanks to everyone who helped make this evening's program a success. And I want to challenge you to remember that youth ministry is hinged on two principles, salvation and service. I challenge you therefore to be saved servants and be agents of hope today and always. Let's pray. Father, as we conclude a day of rest and peace with you, as we conclude a Sabbath where we could have spent time with you as our creator and redeemer and together as a conference family, we pray that you would help us to stand tall in a dying world, help us to stand brave in a falling world, and help us to be agents of hope in times like these. May we never forget that you are our hope, you are our redeemer, and you are our God. Thank you for saving us. Equip us to serve in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us on AY I Connect. What a wonderful day we have had. Our hearts were blessed by the various presentations and activities. Thus we say thank you to all of the members of our conference family who unstintingly provided their time and talents to the execution of this program. As we look forward to the coming week, it is our prayer that you will remain healthy and safe as we continue to face the challenges of the coronavirus COVID-19 together. From the East Caribbean Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, stay safe. Until we meet again, God bless.